Welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope you've had your share of uh, good coffee and bad bagels. Uh, sorry, they're not, they're not good New York bagels. You know, around the corner where I live in Brooklyn, I have great bagels. The, this is food service bagels, but they're fine. Uh, <laughs> But thank you for coming. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, welcome to this, uh, the 2019 Business Anthropology Summit at Fordham University in New York. Uh, we're really pleased you're here. And uh, we're, we're, it's just been such a tremendous turnout this year. So last year, Alan Bateau, where's Alan? They're here. I want to thank Alan Bateau for starting the Business Anthropology <laughs> He started the Business Anthropology Summit. We had 74 turnout, and this year we had registration of 221, so more people will come. It's really a growing field, and we're really excited about this. Um, so we're really pleased that Business Anthropology is clearly growing. But before we begin, I want to introduce really a key figure at uh, Gabelli School of Business who's always open to new approaches and seeking new ways of improving business education. Um, our marketing area at Gabelli has really taken off in the last few years. The whole Gabelli School of Business, we thank Mario Gabelli for that. Uh, and it's, we're now ranked 18th uh, by US News, News and World Report, uh, partly because of his efforts. So I'm pleased to introduce our marketing professor, Sertan Kabadai, the Gabelli School of Business Area Chair of Marketing, and I thank him along with Dean uh, Donna Rapacioli for supporting the conference and making all of this possible. So here's Sir Tan. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I think, can you all hear me? I only hate the mic. Uh, it's my real pleasure to welcome you all uh, to Gabelli School of Business. Uh, when last year, I think it was last year, when Tim uh, came to me with the proposal of hosting the summit, I did not even think twice uh, for a very specific reason. In, in business school, but especially in marketing area, we really understand and appreciate the importance of business anthropology. And uh, we just don't say it uh, because our undergraduate program is located in the Bronx at Trotsdale Campus. That's a much bigger undergraduate program. But five years ago, we decided to launch a new version of undergraduate program in the same building, in this campus. And guess what? We call that marketing concentration consumer insights concentration. Mm -hmm. And in that program, students take courses on business anthropology, cultural anthropology, cross-cultural consumer insights, and not surprisingly, Tim is the academic director of that concentration. And at the graduate level, we have an MS program in marketing intelligence. Again, consumer insight is a required course for those master students as well. So this is why we really appreciate business anthropology, and we are very much determined to be one of the major business schools in the country to emphasize business anthropology going forward. So I'm going to be in and out. Uh, I have other, you know, when you're a chair, everyone's business becomes your business. So I have a couple of other things, but I will be around, so I hope to talk to you more and get to know you more. So again, welcome to WWE and enjoy today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Tan. Um, just before we start, too, I want to take this moment to call out and thank a few other people, our, certainly our steering committee that helped put this together. Uh, Mustafa Abdallah, Alan Bateau, Elizabeth Bryady, Pat Ensworth, Melissa Fisher, Julie Greenberg, Josh Kaplan, Derek Newberry, Alexandra Mack, Barbara Olson, Inga Treitler, uh, many of whom also are going to be the panel moderators and workshop leaders today and tomorrow. And I especially want to call out and thank our sponsors that made this possible. We had tremendous sponsorship help that funded the food that you have, not so good bagels, but the good coffee, and the good, the good lunch and the reception we'll have. And these uh, sponsors are the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, uh, Wayne State University, KRI Insights and Research, uh, the American Anthropological Association, thank you, Ed Lebo, uh, Menlo Innovations, Wyman, Schnee, and Morace, and Fordham's Gabelli School of Business, all of who have provided for accommodations and support for the summit. And I, I thank Alan again for starting this, uh, uh, this the summit. And I also want to call out and thank Ida LaHood. Where's Ida? 
All right, so she's our marketing program manager. Yes, for, for your tremendous help in coordinating all this. So thank you all uh, for the support. So as we know, business anthropology spans the disciplines of anthropology, marketing, consumer research, uh, design, organizational change and management. And with this in mind, this is how we developed the goals for our site this year. Uh, we wanted this to, to focus on practical outcomes for the summit. Uh, this was, and, and our goal in this sense was not only to increase the awareness of anthropologists in the field, but actually how can we increase demand for business anthropology? We wanted to increase demand. So unlike other great academic uh, conferences, you can go to the AAA, wonderful session, uh, the SFAA or EPIC, where you have scholarly papers read and discussed. We omitted the papers in this, and we just focused on practical outcomes, as, as I mentioned. And our objective is how we can help anthropologists increase demand in both academia and in business. We're doing this through a series of workshops and panelists that uh, will discuss issues and, and topics that are relevant for anthropologists finding work and in increasing their relevance and increasing their demand in business today. So that's really been our goal, and that's why we've set up the, this, this uh, summit in a, in a certain way with uh, panelists, and we're gonna have workshops. They will be downstairs uh, when we take a break after this. So to talk about more about the uh, agenda today, I introduced my co-partner and colleague, Bob Morais, who will take you through this. And uh, actually, I want to thank him, too, for all the work in helping putting all this together. And so. thanks, and thanks to Tim. Yeah. So I'm going to take you through the agenda, if I can figure out how to move this. How do I move the... Uh, uh, the clicker. Oh, the natural clicker. Um, by the way, I did a calculation, on, and I realized that uh, if we keep growing exponentially, we'll have more business anthropologists than there are people in the state of New Jersey by the, by the 10th summit. So uh, if anyone wants to keep track of that and call me on that, you can, uh, you can get back to it. Uh, one of the things that I learned in advertising is that you can tell people something 17 times, or at least you can send out a message 17 times, and people still don't read it. Uh, they don't see it. Um, I am sure that some of you have paid a lot of attention to the 50 emails that you've received every month, uh, to the many posts that we've had on the summit, but I wanted to take a few minutes to go through the agenda so you know what you're going to be doing for the next few days, and uh, next two days, and, um, and you'll also get some help in navigating the corridors here. Uh, it's not that tough. This, this is a beautiful building. It's, we're set up in a way that will make it very easy for people to get around and avoid whatever rain may come our way. Um, so today's Wednesday. Uh, you've had some breakfast. I won't make a comment on the bagels, but uh, you know you can get. If you're not from out of town, this is not what New York bagels look like. Uh, they're actually about ten times the size. Um, there's actually a place uh, a little north of here that charges ten cents if you want your bagel toasted, because it's such an insult to have a bagel toasted in New York. Um, at nine o'clock to 9.45, we're doing this. We may not take the full 45 minutes because we want to have plenty of opportunities for bio breaks, for phone calls, for whatever else you may have to do. And you'll see the day is structured with that in mind. Um, uh, Ed Lebo will, just come, will come up in a couple of minutes. There's Ed right there. Just to, uh, from uh, Ed, of course, from the American Anthropological Association to talk about uh, his perspective on all of what he sees here. And he's been very generous in his support for us. Um, and then we're going to get right into a panel. Now, as Tim said, the way we conceive this is not about academic papers. But of course, though, there are some scholar practitioners here. There are some pure scholars and some pure practitioners here. We hope that what we orchestrated will appeal to everyone. There may be some academic papers that come out of all of this. In fact, we hope there are some. We also hope there are other kinds of publications that come out of this that reach the broader public. So that would be great, too. Uh, so there's a first panel that Melissa Fisher will lead, uh, which was really an attempt to define business anthropology. There's also a workshop on that. Uh, you can refer, does everybody have their packets? It looks like most people do. You can see the workshop's detail. There's an abstract for each one, and, uh, and there's a room for each one, but again, you'll get some guidance on that, so you can choose a workshop if you haven't already. If you didn't get to choose a workshop, don't worry about it. You can just find one and walk in, nobody's going to throw you out. We're not that strict about it. Uh, uh, and then there'll be a, a, just a very short break uh, if you want to get some coffee. Uh, and then panel two, so all of that is right here. 
So the first of the morning is right here uh, for another one hour panel, and Derek Newberry is leading that. And then we have lunch in Platte Court. If the weather is nice enough, people can sit outside, or and there's, a, there's another place to sit right down a few steps from here. You'll get some guidance for that. Yes, yeah, so yeah. you can go up the steps and go out, so you can get into the nice courtyard. It's really pretty here. So we've given you portable lunches, you can take it outside. Yeah. Nice little courtyard. And, uh, and then we've got our workshops. Uh, so the way we've designed this is that there are concurrent workshops. You probably know this already, but I'll just remind you. Four for one two-hour block, four for another two-hour block. The workshops are actually 90 minutes, and the reason for the extra time is if they go over, they start a little late, there's time for that. And, and uh, what we're hoping for those workshops and for the workshops tomorrow is that everyone walks out with a feeling of what's next. That in some workshops, some workshops are maybe more about training, but many of those workshops are focused on what do we do about business anthropology to get the word out, to increase demand, because that is, as Tim said, the theme of this conference, or summit, really. Uh, and, and to speak to that, people will speak about their workshops. So at the end of today, at 5 o'clock, so the workshops run between about 1 and 4, I'm sorry, 1 and 5, and then at 5 o'clock, 5 to 6, uh, each, there are two facilitators for every workshop. Workshop facilitators either will both speak or one of them will speak for about five minutes, no more, to address really what was covered in the workshop, how excited they are, hopefully, about what they discussed, and next steps coming out of that, all in five minutes. No slides for that. Elizabeth Briarty is also going to say something about a little initiative that we've been working on called An Business Anthropology on the, word, on the Road. Uh, which uh, intends to teach anthropologists in anthropology departments that don't teach business anthropology but have students that would like to learn about it, how to teach it, but also to help students get jobs, anthropology majors get jobs, that may not be in anthropology per se, although of course once they have those jobs they'll redefine them hopefully as, uh, as anthropology jobs. And then there'll be reception in Platte Court that is uh, sponsored by the AAA. There is a cash bar, but the food is sponsored by the AAA, and that's, and then that's thanks to Ed. Just a quick glance at uh, day two, uh, just a very quick preview of the day, 15 minutes right after breakfast. Again, arrive between 8 and 9, we'll be in here, and then we're going to go right into the, uh, the third panel. Uh, and uh, that's a connection between anthropology and technology, which is really something that a lot of us have in our minds one way or another, whether we like it or not. Uh, and then there'll be a quick break. Uh, then we're going to do workshops. So we've split this up a little bit differently. So there'll be three concurrent workshops. So you'll choose one of those, also 90 minutes. We'll have lunch again. And then, uh, and by the way, all the food is supplied, so don't feel like you have to, there's no tip jar, there's no, there's no jar, you, have to, you, don't, you don't have to pay anything for that. Um, and then panel four uh, is one that we think is particularly interesting and a great way to end this session, uh, this is really the, the full two sessions, um, which is about unintended consequences and things that can happen when we engage and how we might engage. And then there'll be workshop summaries again, and then there'll be some closing remarks. And one of, the, one of the exciting things is that we already know that Summit 3 will be in Berlin next year. And you'll get a little preview of that at the end of, the, of, at the end of that day. And the last thing that I want to say with regard to this is that there is a website. It's called it's www.businessanthro.com. We couldn't get anthropology, so we had to abbreviate it. The website's been up for a while. If you haven't become a member, please do, because it's a, it's, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything uh, to us other than keeping a sense of where people are and who they are and getting our head count up. But to you, it means a lot because there are a lot of resources there. So, for example, if you're teaching business anthropology, you can access syllabi. If, you, if somebody asks you for references, there are references there. Uh, if you know of references that are not there, send them to us. We'll get them up. Uh, Adam Gladwell and Matt Arts will help us get everything up very quickly. Uh, there's a news and events section, so whenever an article is published that we think should be shared, we get that up there, and then sometimes it's reposted from them. We try to keep that current. We would encourage you to contribute to that when you get a feel for it, uh, both in terms of articles, short articles, uh, Syllabi, if you're teaching business anthropology, any form of it, 
please share your syllabi because those things are very, very useful for people. Uh, and resources, again, if we, if we don't have something up there, please give it, it could be videos, it could be articles, it could be books. We don't, we don't uh, have every article listed, but we have key journals, but then we've got major books, edited, authored books, and so on. So all that said, are there any questions about how things are gonna go? Do you all know where the restrooms are? Okay. So moving from restrooms to the American Anthropological Association. <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce Ed Lebo. Uh, just a couple of words about, um, about Ed. Ed is a cultural anthropologist who's worked in applied anthropology. He's the executive director of the AAA. Uh, and he has been uh, a big supporter of everything we've been doing in, in business anthropology, at least for the last several years, and I think probably going back beyond that. Um, but uh, I want to read something. This is uh, from an email that um, Ed sent yesterday. Um, Elizabeth and I uh, did a little piece for Anthropology News on this Anthropology on the Road initiative, which you can um, go to Anthropology News. I think it's anthro anthropology-news.com. If you, if you, or anth uh, no, Anthropology, if you just do Anthropology-news, you'll get there. But if you go Anthropology News without the dash, you go somewhere else. Unfortunately. So anyway, we were talking a little bit about that initiative. And, and, and then, um, this is what Ed said, and I got his permission right before I introduced him to read this. This was to, uh, to Bob and Elizabeth. That's Elizabeth Bridey. Um, we are all for pushing departments to align their training programs with the need to prepare students for a diverse range of careers, including careers in business, government, and nonprofit profit sectors. And then he said, a line that I'm going to remember for a long time, and I'm probably going to use, and I'll try to attribute it to you, but I may just steal it. <laughs> um, imagine if law schools only prepared law students for careers as law school professors, mm -hmm. or if business schools only prepared students for careers as business school professors, mm -hmm. and then Tim mentioned, I'll give you the, the shout out on this one, or if medical schools only prepared, prepared doctors to be medical school professors. So isn't it ironic, really, that anthropology departments, too many of them still prepare, certainly graduate students, only to be anthropology professors. Um, that's certainly a laudable objective and a valuable objective, but there are other avenues. So with that said, I introduce Ed, and then I'll just come back up for a minute. And then. Thanks, Bob. And uh, thanks, Tim, and, uh, and, and the Fordham School for hosting this really important uh, gathering. Um, and for giving us the opportunity at the association to be able to uh, support this work. I'm seven, in my seventh year now on this job after nearly three decades in the R&D world. Um, and I have to tell you that it's still every day uh, an opportunity that never gets old to be an evangelist for the important work that anthropology uh, can contribute uh, to making this a more just and sustainable world. And um, it's our second year, of course, here at the summit on behalf of the association. Um, I, I want to give a shout out to a couple of our other staff who are here. Uh, Daniel Ginsberg, who is our manager of education, research, and professional development. Um, and uh, Somebody who works with Daniel, I think, is on an early train, but I'm not. Oh, okay, there she is, Palmyra Jackson, who I, I want to I point out the job that Palmyra has because I think it's really important to the future of the association and the discipline. She works in education, research, and professional development with a special focus on pipeline issues. That is, where is the next generation of anthropologists going to come from, and how are we going to prepare them for this diverse range of uh, careers? And so it's an important investment that I think that um, the association, those of you who are members, your dues are helping to support this um, investment, and we're expecting uh, big things um, in the way of a return on that investment as well. Uh, so I, I also also uh, I need to recognize uh, one of my bosses. You know, I work for the executive board of the association, and among the many hats she wears, Elizabeth Bryady is currently serving as the secretary of our executive board. I should say the indefatigable Elizabeth Bryany. Thank you for that. Um, this is a formidable gathering of uh, dedication and expertise, um, and uh, I see a lot of 
longtime friends as well as new acquaintances um, here, and um, I'm really happy that the association is able to be a part of it. One of the things that I've learned in the time uh, that I've been connected to the association in various capacities is, is what the superpowers of an association like ours might be. And it's, I think it's worth um, uh, uh, rehearsing this um, because uh, we value your partnerships in trying to um, exercise these superpowers. And there are three of them, really. One of them is to um, set and disseminate the standards, both for intellectual rigor and responsible professional conduct. That's something that is absolutely central to our mission as an association. The second is a convening power that we have, that is to bring professionals together for the purposes of uh, exchanging ideas and networking, and, and perhaps um, the one that uh, we work uh, the, the most amount of labor on. It's hard to tell what the return on that investment is all the time, but it is the role of the association to increase public awareness of the important things um, that anthropologists do. We're not the only ones uh, uh, who do that, but if you go back and look at the proceedings uh, from uh, last year's uh, summit uh, clearly ringing through, resonating with us at least at the association office is the importance of increasing public awareness. We're, we're not really at a crisis stage yet, but I, I'll use a nautical analogy as a sailor. I see the clouds boiling up on the horizon out there. Um, uh, uh, anthropology is not considered a job ready major. Um, and in this uh, increasing uh, atmosphere of accountability in colleges of arts and sciences, um, in particular where people are looking at enrollments and other kind of key performance indicators uh, to assess the demand for um, this field, we really need to increase the awareness um, of the public about the importance of the kind of training that we offer to students at the undergraduate as well as graduate levels. Um, uh, which is one of the reasons why um, our focus on pre-college initiatives and pipelines um, uh, operating on the hypothesis that the, um, uh, the more we expose kids in primary and secondary uh, grades to key concepts and ideas in anthropology, the more likely they are when they come to a college or university campus uh, to consider enrolling in a class. And I dare say most of us would um, would attribute the reason we're in this field uh, to a cool teacher that we had um, somewhere along the way, who at least got us to take um, a next class and a next class, and before we knew it, um, this was something that was uh, really important uh, to us. So, so the superpowers, again, the, the standard setting, the convening, and the power of voice, that is a, a increasing public awareness about the uh, uh, importance of the association. On, on this last point, um, uh, in my notes here I say, it's not just the cool things that anthropology does. It is um, most important to me personally that we're calling attention to the ways in which our work, our scholarship and its applications um, can contribute to a more just and sustainable world. And it's on this note in particular in the context of the intersection of anthropology and business um, that I'd, I'd like to use um, uh, th this podium for just a couple minutes, I'll, I'll tell a story on myself. You know, back in the old days uh, uh, when Epic was getting formed and Ken Anderson and Tracy Lovejoy and Alex and, and Melissa and uh, uh, Maria, uh, a number of people were involved in getting that started. I started um, proposing papers to the Epic group on corporate social responsibility and um, unpacking the notion of that. So I went, I had a, a, a sort of a Chicago Cubs kind of streak here. I went for 10 years submitting papers um, that all got rejected. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and just to, you know, just to prove the transparency and uh, um, egalitarianism of the, of the EPIC paper selection process, I was on the board of EPIC at the time. <laughs> um, but I'm really heartened to see that this is coming around now. Um, it, that is to say, 
um, woven throughout the next day and a half, um, all the discussions here, is an important and substantive discussion about ways in which um, ethnographic work in its applications can help businesses become tools for social change. This is absolutely central to my own personal commitment um, to the field. And I think that there are a lot of different ways in which uh, this can happen, in which it gets fed into the pedagogy, in which that pedagogy then um, translates into job and career ready training at the undergraduate and graduate levels as well. And so I just, yeah, you know, there are ways through, uh, um, you know, consumer culture theory, for example, that we can think about the material consumption um, and what our understandings are and where upstream interventions can be in patterns of material consumption uh, that can contribute to uh, more sustainability. We can ex uh, exact from uh, corporations uh, institutional changes that help them to expand their uh, fiduciary duty uh, to require consideration of non-financial interests. Um, in, in the decisions that they make. Um, and we can also use our ethnographic um, uh, skills to, uh, uh, to monitor overall uh, performance of organizations with um, a, any number of uh, key performance indicators. I just leave you with a, a, a couple of thoughts in the business world. I, I lived in Seattle for three decades, and so we have this uh, interesting stratigraphy of every form of economic um, uh, enterprise in North America from the natural resources to the manufacturing to the service and tech um, industries that have accreted over um, the decades in the last century and a half. And I think to myself, for example, if Starbucks wants to be in the coffee business 50 years from now, it needs to pay attention to the plight of the growers that are growing that specialty coffee crop for them uh, wherever that's found. Um, if um, uh, Microsoft expects to be in the software and hardware business lines that it's in um, uh, today, it needs to be thinking about how electrical energy is uh, generated and transmitted um, across, uh, uh, um, across the planet um, as well. So, so these are not just sort of uh, ivory tower speculations out there about the importance of understanding consumer behavior, um, unpacking this notion of fiduciary responsibility, and applying our tools to um, monitoring the kind of performance that can be expected of businesses. And th that's one of the reasons why I personally am committed um, and committing association resources uh, to work with the larger community of anthropologists at the intersection of business. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the next day and a half and, uh, and learning tons uh, from all of you. So thanks for listening to me. We're going to get started. From time to time, some of you may be asked what business anthropology is. And probably if there are 200 people here, there are at least 250 responses. Uh, I think that one of the things that we wanted to do, I know one of the things we wanted to do was not define what business anthropology is definitively, but to move the conversation forward, to talk about business anthropology from a number of perspectives. Uh, Tim mentioned marketing and advertising is one sector, organizational culture is another, design thinking is another. Maybe those are the big three. Those are what we seem to think are the big three, but there's so much more that business anthropology is. That's what this panel aims to address, and there is also a workshop that will define business anthropology and how it engages, for example, with the AAA, SFAA, EPIC, and other organizations, and also just how we think about it and talk about it moving forward. So, um, Melissa is, is uh, moderating this panel. She'll introduce everyone. I'm not going to give a long bio on Melissa. You can read about it. You can read about her online. You can, uh, there, in the uh, handouts that you have, there are all the details on um, well, the names of the, the people on each, you know, on each panel, uh, and, and of course the moderators and the facilitators of the workshops too. But uh, those are hot links, so if you go on to businessanthro.com, you can click on the names and you can read all about the people. 
So that'll give you more information. Thanks, Bob. So it's really a pleasure to be here and to really start off what we want to discuss, which is essentially thinking about what is the meaning, what are the multiple definitions of what we're calling business and organizational anthropology. And as Bob said, of course, there are lots of other ways in which anthropologists talk about business, whether it's corporate ethnography, anthropology of capitalism, anthropology of finance. And it's my distinct pleasure to have a really illustrious set of people speaking to us today who come from quite a range of experiences, going from a very academic kind of um, career path to uh, more applied kinds of settings. And that's what we wanted to do, right? To have people who could talk to both quote unquote sides, and we don't really think about them as sides, but the kind of blurring boundaries between business applied, however you want to call it, and a more academic kind of setting and kind of work. So I've asked each person to give us a opportunity to hear about how business and organizational anthropology as they understand it or how they've contributed to thinking about it has defined or they've experienced it throughout their careers, how they've used it in their work, the kind of work that they've done, and what they really see for the future. So I think it will generate a really interesting conversation and then we'll have time for questions. I'm hoping that they'll talk to each other and maybe we'll have a Q&A depending on our time because we have a several, a, a lot of people on the panel and they have a lot of interesting things to say. So again, the hot links are available, um, and I encourage you to read about each panelist. Um, they're all each very interesting, but I'm going to give very brief introductions um, in alphabetical order. So uh, Rachel Laria is a doctoral student, and she's at Yale. She's doing a joint degree program in anthropology and African American studies, and she'll be talking about her work and. He's just got to be ABD, so I think we should all give a round of applause. It's very exciting. In two years, uh, Grant McGracken, as most of you will know, is a consulting anthropologist and academic without portfolio. He's on there. That's how, that is his, how his title goes. Jillian Tett, who I'm sure you all know also, is chairman of the editorial board and editor of large of the US Financial Times. We're very excited to have her. Christina Wasson, who also most of you know, is a professor of anthropology, design anthropology at the University of North Texas. And then right here is Caitlin Saloom, who's a cultural anthropologist, associate professor of social and cultural analysis at NYU and editor of public books. So it's quite an extraordinary group. As I said, I asked each individual to sort of think about their own, how their personal biography intersects with the field or the history of business and organizational anthropology, and they're each going to take about five or six minutes. I have my phone, and I promise to watch them and um, give them an opportunity to tell, tell you a little bit about themselves and, and what they see, and then we'll go into Q&A. Can you all hear us? I, I realize it's OK. And I've got mics if you can. OK, thanks. The first person is going to be Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you to Bob and Tim for organizing this truly fabulous day, and also to Ed for being here, too. It's really exciting to be here. Um, now, by the standards of most people in the room, I am deeply weird, um, because I started my life um, doing a PhD in cultural anthropology, very much in the traditional school of anthropology out of the UK, out of Cambridge. Um, my field of study was Tajikistan, and I looked at Tajik wedding rituals. And that is not an obvious background from which to then build a career doing financial journalism looking at Wall Street. But that's what I did. Um, I got into journalism almost by accident because there was a war in Tajikistan and I effectively became a war reporter by default doing human rights work. And then realized very simply that money makes the world go round. And if you don't understand how money is moving, you actually don't understand a lot of political cultural issues. But if you only look at money in terms of money, you don't understand anything either. So I moved into the world of journalism. And I must admit, I spent the first few years feeling rather like an undercover anthropologist. Because whenever I met grown up um, financial journalists, or financiers, or central bankers, or economists, and told them that I had a PhD, that asked me what it was in, assuming it was economics, or an MBA, or astrophysics. And when I said anthropology, they'd look at me and go, oh, and there'd be a long silence. <laughs> when I told them that it was about Tajik marriage rituals, they'd go, oh. <laughs> and as one of them said, isn't that rather hippie? 
<laughs> These days, thankfully, being hippies are quite a good thing. Um, but there's actually a very key point, because I realised at about 2005, 6, 7, 8, that actually anthropology was fantastically useful for looking at finance, for the simple reason that anthropology gives you lateral vision. It gives you 3D vision. And that is really powerful in a world where most professions have one or at best 2D vision and most professions train people to look at the world through tunnel vision. It's that simple. Anthropology gives you lateral vision in a world where almost everyone else is trained to have tunnel vision. And what's more important is that right now, the way that careers and professions are progressing means there's a huge emphasis placed on extreme technical competence and knowledge that encourages even more tunnel vision than they used to be. And as organizations and companies are under financial pressure, the first thing they do is to streamline their operations, which means, guess what, even more tunnel vision. So the fact that anthropology offers lateral vision is absolutely crucial. And I first realized that briefly in relation to the financial sector. I was running the financial team at the FT for a while and realized that one reason why the financial system went mad before 2007 and 8 was because financiers who were in engaged in things like credit derivatives only ever looked at their own little trading portfolio. They never had the lateral vision to understand the bigger picture. People like Melissa know that well, as so do Caitlin, Karen Ho, illustrated that beautifully, et cetera, et cetera. Since then, I've moved on, and I'm looking at a whole range of business fields. I am particularly fascinated by tech, because tech, in my view, replicates many of the same issues in finance about not just the fact you have a group of young, mostly young people, innovators, who've come fantastically wealthy and arrogant very fast, but you also have the same problem of tunnel vision all over again. It's very, very striking indeed in the tech sector. So my last point is this. I think that now is a golden moment for anthropology. When I go to bank CEOs who are badly burnt and explain what I do now, I'm no longer embarrassed about being an anthropologist. I don't get asked about being a hippie. In fact, people are really interested and they're hungry for knowledge. When I go to Silicon Valley again, and I talk to a lot of um, these techie CEOs and C-suite people, they're really, really interested, interested in this stuff. So to me, the challenge today is how do we take this body of brilliant knowledge that's out there, this ability to have lateral vision in a world of tunnel vision, 3D vision at a time of 1 or 2D vision, how do we communicate its value, really get people excited, and try and get engaged? That involves some big compromises. I know I'm a journalist. I'm paid to be shallow half the time. <laughs> I, I think in headlines. But somehow we have to get these insights out. And the very, very last thing I'd say is the challenge in my view is that anthropology is so brilliant because it trains its disciples to essentially be humble and observe and to listen. And if you like, to sit in the bushes and to watch others. And it trains its, its disciples to be very cynical about power structures and money. And I salute that, and that's part of its genius. The challenge today is that that set of skills are precisely the opposite of what you need to hustle and to fight for resources. So how do we square that circle? And I'm sorry I've gone over. No, it's quite all right. That is, I'm just going to take a mic for one second. Sure. That's sorry, okay. sharing economy. We're sharing the mic. That's yeah, that's a great segue to um, Caitlin Saloon, who's going to really be talking, I think, in part about our methods. So it's mm -hmm. perfect. All right. Okay. okay. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you to the organizers and to Melissa for having me here today. Um, I, I, I love that Jillian shared the trajectory of, of her career. Um, and I will also share a funny thing about mine, because I think that it, it, it's it, our life trajectories have so much to do with or where this lateral vision comes from. So I went to graduate school thinking that I was going to study the reconstruction of Beirut after the Civil War, and I ended up studying derivatives traders in Chicago and London. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a longer story behind that, of course, but, um, but there's, there's a kind of unifying force uh, within it that I think we all share, which is our commitment to studying the world from the perspective of the people with whom we are talking and to trying to understand how they see the world from their specific location. I'm sure that all of you recognize this and I just want to underscore it as being a really unique and important feature of what anthropology can contribute in terms of knowledge to the world. So even though I did this weird swing from, from Beirut to, uh, to Chicago and London and global futures markets, um, I took with me alongside that a real commitment to viewing the world from within, uh, from with, within the problems as people who I was speaking with defined them. And <clears throat> what that means, um, too, is that we always will be able to see problems in a way that is different from the kind of siloed, neat, organizational chart perspective. Once you take the perspective of the people that you're talking to, they're always bringing resources, um, associations, uh, cultural forms in with them that have nothing to do with how a business or an organization sees itself. I think that it is fundamentally a silo-breaking endeavor, uh, which is part, I think, of why we get the kind of lateral vision that, um, that Jillian has said uh, is so very important. And of course, I've seen this um, throughout my research, but I want to give you a couple um, uh, of examples from, uh, from my latest work, which is uh, uh, coming out as a book in the fall. It's called in uh, Indebted. And it is about how student debt and the problem of paying for college have changed family life in the United States. Um, <clears throat> so first, taking the perspective of students and parents um, guided the way that I did the research for, for, for this book. Of course, as an anthropologist, my first instinct was to look for sites of, of participant observation. Impossible. Can't do it in this case because middle class people will not talk about their money in public. It, I mean, the resistance to my, to my method of, of not only um, participant observation, but also just even in asking for interviews, people resisted this very, very distinctly. And that taught me just how important it is for middle class people to maintain silence about their money. Um, so, so it was in. It was both by taking their perspective and then recognizing how their perspective um, challenged my my own that I brought from from uh, from the university. You know, I had this very nice research design that they totally exploded. Um, <laughs> that then led me to really uh, really seek out enough people, and it took years um, to build the portfolio of 160 interviews that that I have with students and parents about about student debt. Um, <clears throat> but I had to meet them on their own terrain, and that itself was already a valuable experience and one that, um, that I hope I, I do a good job um, representing in Indebted. Um, <clears throat> so the interviews revolved around how uh, the families valued education and how they decided to pay for it and what they understood their futures to be within this, this, uh, within this kind of weighed down complex that student debt has, has given them. Um, in fact, uh, the cost of college is, as I've been referring to it, to it, most often referred to as student debt. And this term itself should be um, understood as a problem because it's a, it's a term that came from the, uh, the terms of contracts. A, st a student debt problem is a problem that a young adult has once they have signed a contract um, and been made responsible for a loan. Now, when I talked to students about it, they didn't talk about the contract. They talked about their families. They talked about how they got to college. They talked about how their parents um, raised them to understand money, to, to think about their futures. And the parents talked about it in terms of how they, 
they wanted not only their children's futures to be, um, which is, of course, open and free, the opposite of, of debt, but how they wanted their own futures to be. This is a complex about family, not about individuals and their responsibilities to contract. So following their perspective meant recognizing that the problem, as it's been handed to us by, uh, by financial organizations, including the federal government, which is the biggest lender in the United States, was really insufficient. We really need to get beyond that because the problem that we call student debt is really much deeper and more profound. Um, so then uh, back to the question of what is business or organizational anthropology. Um, really, I believe it is not so different from anthropology. I think that it's mostly uh, really quite the same, um, and it simply touches on objects that we tend to think of as being about either profit making or monetary exchange in some, uh, in, in some dimension, which of course is most everything. <laughs> Um, at least in the kinds of, uh, of capitalist societies that, that we exist in in, in, the, in the U.S. And, uh, and in Europe, and well beyond that, too. Um, so when we think of, uh, of the student debt problem, um, we might think of it instead as, a, uh, as operating within a kind of complex that cuts across all of these things that we think of as business, um, financial investment firms like T. Rowe Price and Vanguard that run the, the savings plans that everybody is supposed to invest in starting when their kids are really young, which nobody does. And then also it, that to think about it as including the federal government, which is the largest lender in, in the United States. And we also need to think about it as including all of the exchanges that happen in family life as we uh, all move through, uh, through raising children or being young adults and, uh, and, and moving forward into the world. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm really stuck. You're going to see a little bit of a kind of continuity in terms of finance, but since we are living, as Kate said, in a capitalist society where we have the financialization of nearly everything, um, kind of makes sense. So I'm going to give you Rachel, who is in the process of about to start a dissertation. So. Thank you, Melissa. Um, so I will say that I guess my relationship with business anthropology really started during my undergrad. Um, where I studied social and cultural analysis and was taught mainly by anthropologists, Melissa being one of them. Um, and so I never thought that I would have ended up kind of in the finance industry, but through recruiting uh, during my senior year, I wound up at Goldman Sachs on a really tiny team focused on corporate social responsibility. And even then, I was like, how am I going to be successful in this kind of space? But they were really interested in the way that I thought about the different CSR initiatives that they were doing, the kind of questions I was asking, and this kind of lateral vision um, became really important. So within the world of CSR at Goldman, I was really focused on environmental social governance. And so thinking about the firm's kind of internal environmental initiatives um, and its own kind of robust tracking of its, you know, carbon use, you know, its lead certifications for its buildings, things like that. Um, but the part that I enjoyed the most was really the social piece of that and the social impact and really creating these very localized signature community engagement initiatives, both in New York and New Jersey, um, where the firm both from a reputational risk management perspective, but then also from an understanding of this is just the right thing to do, um, to think about how can we be, you know, quote unquote, good neighbors and really leverage um, the community that we are a part of um, and our employees are a part of. And so that was really interesting work. Um, and then the governance piece of that in terms of just kind of global reporting and tracking of the various initiatives that the firm had underway. And so I was doing all of that kind of work and I became very interested in questions of race and finance and the relationship between those two things as um, one of the very few people of color and specifically black people um, within the division and the only person of color on my team at the time, um, I was really interested to think about 
what it might mean for someone like me to do corporate social responsibility work, to be in these communities, to be in some respects the face of the firm in thinking about kind of how do we engage these nonprofit organizations. Um, and so those were questions that I was thinking about a lot and then informed the graduate and research that I do now which looks at black capitalists and the transatlantic financial industry in the contemporary moment. So I study folks who, black capitalists who are both on Wall Street and how they kind of navigate that space and how they strive within a business that really struggles to reckon with um, the historical and contemporary problems associated with institutional racism. Um, and then for those who choose to leave that space, specifically Wall Street, um, but still preserve some kind of relationship with the financial industry, you s I've seen trends in which a lot of them go you know, across the Atlantic to West Africa to create financial institutions of their own and how they're kind of rethinking what they want financial business to be. Um, and so that's you know, what my work looks like now, and it was very much started from, you know, my experience at Goldman and before in my undergraduate studies thinking about these questions of race and finance, gender and intersectional processes. Um, yeah, and so that's kind of how I get into the work, and then even thinking about my own definition of anthropology, which I think applies to a business of anthropology and how I might understand it is, looking and understanding the discrepancy between how people narrate their lives and how their lives are organized institutionally or within an organization. And so, um, to what Caitlin was saying before, when you actually talk to people, you see how these silos kind of tend to explode. And so, um, being very invested in thinking about that and how it kind of naturally applies to business as well. Um, and so that's the research. I'm also a business owner, and um, and it's in the food business. And my business is called Kelowelle, and we create innovative and culturally inspired plantain dishes, which is kind of fun and quirky, um, but it's really kind of guided by this understanding of culture and the impact and importance of culture when we talk about food. Um, and you see it in how people kind of have these oral histories that come out when they're eating food, when they're engaging, and they're evoking these feelings of memory and belonging and community. Um, and even diaspora, when we situate plantains, you know, within Africa or, you know, the Caribbean, Latin America, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think about kind of the business of anthropo anthropology in a very kind of holistic sense. So thank you. That's great. Thank you. And, and it's great food. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so several times. Um, our next speaker is going to be Christina, who I think is going to talk about, more about design and move us a slightly different direction. Um, so, um, to start with a little background, I have a long history uh, of bridging multiple worlds. Oh, closer? Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Is this good? Okay. So, um, so starting in my childhood, I bridged um, Germany and the United States. My mom is German. My dad is American. I grew up sort of in both countries. Um, in my studies, I bridged anthropology and linguistics. Uh, in my work then, I came to bridge academia and industry, and then within that, that work frame of what's now, I guess, called business uh, design anthropology, um, I bridged ethnographic approaches with the design of technologies. And um, with regard to what might be called business anthropology, I have occupied a variety of different positions from working for business, I've worked for two consulting firms, to um, being um, a professor at a university, um, to, um, but then also conducting applied projects as a professor, um, doing non-applied research as an academic, and then also training the next generation of design anthropologists by doing applied projects um, in class settings. So um, speaking from this kind of multiply determined positionality, um, well, so um, to go to the, the kind of goal of our, our panel, I guess, of like what is business anthropology and where the different ways we can think about it. So one way um, that people seem to have been talking about it recently, one way to cut it up is um, that people have been talking about an anthropology of business versus an anthropology for business, meaning if you're for business, if you're 
in anthropology of business would be usually conducted by a researcher in a university context so that when they study business, they have sort of a more distanced approach, while anthropology for business um, refers to anthropologists who are employees in business organizations or, um, or uh, maybe consultants. So um, I would argue that this, this kind of binary opposition of, of business versus for business hides more than it reveals. Um, there was a 2017 um, issue of the Journal of Business Anthropology that kind of pulled apart some of those distinctions. Um, I think in some ways, I mean, the, calling it, you know, an issue about of business versus for business sort of replicated that binary opposition. But if you looked at the different papers in the issue, they each author had kind of multiple positionings. And by the end, you had this kind of nice kaleidoscope of, of different positionings, which kind of deconstructed the, the opposition. Um, what I also liked about that issue was that um, both of the Melissas that contributed to it, Melissa Fisher and Melissa Sefkin, um, linked the, um, the issue back to kind of more general issues in anthropology. And of course, since the beginning, anthropologists have been concerned about their positioning vis-a-vis -vis the organizations or communities they study and how their positioning affects the research results. So that has really always been a general preoccupation of business. So kind of, as Caitlin said, um, I think there's a lot of continuity between business anthropology and just anthropology as a whole. And I think the more we can draw those, those connections and show how there's a relationship and how business anthropology is contributing to anthropology as a whole, I think that's a useful thing for us to do. Um, when I was a graduate student at Yale in the 1990s, there was, oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. So um, I also think that um, this kind of distinction between an anthropology of business versus for business kind of relates to a more general um, binary opposition that you see often in kind of academic anthropology of theory versus application. And I know when I was a graduate student in the 1990s, there was kind of an ideology of contempt for application, <laughs> or <laughs> and I would almost say maybe the right term is not ideology so much as hegemony, meaning that our world was so embedded in the world of academia that one almost couldn't imagine, like the idea of doing applied work was almost just outside of what anybody ever thought about. And, and I think maybe that has changed to a degree, but maybe it's also still there. Um, to a degree, and, and so kind of in the interest of making the familiar strange, it's really quite odd that this, <laughs> that this ideology of contempt exists because um, there's a lot of scholarship that has deconstructed that kind of simplistic binary opposition and, and um, ranging from Meta Baba who has, you know, starting with her groundbreaking article in 2000. She's done a lot of sophisticated work kind of exploring those, those relationships since then. And then there's also people outside of anthropology like Donald Stokes, um, who've done also really interesting work um, on the relationship between theory and application in different fields and how it plays out. Um, but yet, that whole body of research does not seem to be very familiar uh, to the field of anthropology. And so I actually think that a promising kind of future investigation, maybe for us as organizational anthropologists, could be um, studying why, um, why, why that ideology of contempt remains so strong. Like how is it benefiting particular, sort of an institution level analysis of how it benefits um, structures, processes, and actors in anthropology. Um, and one other maybe little point on a, a different way of cutting up business anthropology that Melissa asked me to talk about last night um, was, so another way to. <laughs> In the bar. <laughs> was to, um, so a different way of cutting up that, that you often will see is that business anthropology encompasses uh, producers and, and consumers, right? So producers being the organizations and consumers being like design and marketing of products. And so, but 
I feel like as soon as you really start trying to pick apart these taxonomies, they break apart and they no longer work. And so with design anthropology, um, you know, that has been sort of considered for a long time as embedded within business anthropology as a whole, but yet, of course, design is also done outside of the business context. So my own work in recent years has focused on designing archives for indigenous languages and cultures, which has nothing to do with business, but is still design anthropology. So I just throw that out there as the difficulty of trying to pin down what is business anthropology even, that sort of as soon as you try to grasp it, it slides away out of your grasp. Thanks. Um, my model of business anthropology is to divide my life into two pieces, one of which is the consulting work, the other is the anthropological work. In the early days, this was difficult, and I felt like I was crossing back and forth across a closely watched uh, border. Uh, to use a different metaphor, I sometimes felt as if I was riding uneven circus ponies. Uh, there's a lot of just constant kind of uh, turbulence built into my professional and my personal experience. But the point of the exercise was to fund my own anthropology out of my consulting work. And it was a, a sort of a, an obsessive um, undertaking. Let me come back to that story. Clients didn't know or care that there was a second half to what I was doing. Uh, they wanted me just as a consultant. <clears throat> and, um, and I guess that's the striking thing about what I've seen happen over the course of my career is a kind of a looping of the loop. Um, that is to say, they don't necessarily know about what I'm doing on my off hours, but they're increasingly curious about it. So the stuff that was just satisfying my own curiosity and just pursuing ideas that seemed to me to have their own, um, their own interest, those now turn out to be keenly interested, interesting to uh, the people with whom I work uh, at, in, a, in a consulting capacity. So that's something I never anticipated. I, I got better and better at integrating the two pieces of my, of my career. Um, but I never expected my clients to care about the two pieces brought together. <clears throat> so that's something. Um, you know, Marshall, so I guess my inspiration for taking on, I had tenure a couple of times and gave it up with the words of Marshall Solomons ringing in my ears. He said, you know, you, you should just go off and you should study Madison Avenue. That's extremely interesting. And we thought, yeah, right. You're a godlike creature at the University of Chicago with tenure and glory. You want us to risk our careers on something that is, by almost every standard, and especially in this culture that rewards people who undertake this study with contempt, you're asking us to risk everything. Anyhow, that seemed to me increasingly a, a good idea as I began to understand. I was caught up in a, was working at the Royal Ontario Museum running an institute of contemporary culture, and I realized that I was the captive of a culture of no. We would sit around and contemplate new undertakings and the nature of the enterprise, the rhetorical enterprise was to figure out ways to say, no, we can't do this. And to congratulate ourselves for the, the you know, for this exercise of intellectual majesty. We were always about no. So I was desperate to try, to, to try. And you know, so this is interesting. Our clients, I mean, I think there's an idea that uh, our clients really don't get what, what we do and, and, and they'll never come to, to understand it. And frankly, they don't need it. But ju just to give you a couple of examples here, I did something for, uh, well, I'll leave, it's a, an American channel, TV channel, that was, uh, a complex, entertainment complex, I guess they'd call themselves. They're keenly interested in, in the end of genre. The grammar they use to produce programming for TV has just shredded. It's like they've discovered that this vehicle of transport is made out of balsa wood and, and, and paper and it's just come, under, come undone under the, the sheer velocity of the, the, of the culture they must now occupy, in which they must now be compelling to sustain their salaries and their careers and this corporation called NBC, never mind. So they're now living a life that desperately needs, back to Jillian's point, about, um, about, uh, about who, who that other, that, um, b that business other is. They're, they're keenly interested in what an anthropologist uh, has to say 
Another example is I was working with a group of uh, investors over a, a week, and the idea that, and, and I become kind of the fuller, fuller brush man. You know, perhaps you'd like this idea. What about this idea? It's not quite as bad as that, because I only have a few ideas that I tend not to roll them out all at once, uh, or even in a series. <clears throat> but the idea that came, that came really to capture people's attention is the stuff from Polanyi's notion of tacit knowledge. That notion that if you talk to scientists, give an account of what their science is, they can't give you a full account of how they do this thing called science because so much of their knowledge and their understanding is embedded in the assumptions with which they work. That's keenly in interesting to the investment community because increasingly they know every organization lives on, the organizations on which they're betting live in a fantastically turbulent, dynamic world and it's because they have these unexamined assumptions that they fall victim to what's called the black swan phenomenon, right? Out of nowhere comes a change in their, the context in which they must survive that is entirely un unanticipated. This un unanticipation depends entirely upon the fact that they're not scrutinizing their assumptions. These organ organizations might not ever uh, begin this study, but you know what? The street is going to make put them on, is putting them on notice. So that in these investment calls, we strategized how to do this. How do you get the CEO when he or she is called to give an account of why this stock is worthy of investment? Um, how do you ask them to account for their assumptions they don't know they have? You have to press the issue. You have to say what are the issues that uh, uh, what are the assumptions on which this enterprise rests? Um, that, that sometimes uh, um, make themselves manifest. Um, and, and of course, we know exactly what, this will create an industry for anthropologists, here's the good news. The moment the CEO comes out of that investment call with smoke coming out of her ears because she's just been publicly embarrassed by investors asking a series of vexing questions. We think this might, might be your unexamined assumption. Please give us an account of it. The moment that happens is the moment she says, you know, she begin her, you know, her, 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 filled with fury, she's going to say, who's the VP in charge of, of finding our assumptions? And if she doesn't have one, she's going to insist that somebody be appointed. This would be a really good thing for anthropologists to do, right? We're very good at, you could say, a uh, gentleman was talking about the kind of lateral vision, and yes, we do that very well. The thing we also do well is that kind of depth seeking, right? We get under the, 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 the knowledge that exists, that is active in any given cultural moment. There are a set of layers, and, 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 the, and, the, and the cultural curiosity takes you there. Another example here is Wattpad is a company in Toronto, <clears throat> and they made an effort to create a business model to capture value being created by what's called fan fiction. Kids will, 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 will read the Harry Potter series and then begin writing a work of their own. There are a hundred, I'm sorry, there are a million words in the Harry Potter corpus um, written by Rowling. Six billion words have been added to that corpus by, um, by fans. So anyhow, um, I'm sorry, I'm running on. Wattpad is watching people write stories online, and they claim to be able to see genre changing in real time, which gives us full circle here, right? NBC should be buying Wattpad and hiring anthropologists to figure out how it's useful. I just want to end with one point, and that is, it seems to me too often when we talk about business anthropology, when we sit down to write uh, do research and to publish that research, too often it's, for my money, it's about ethnography, too often it's about business anthropology. It seems to me always to be whatever we call it, anthropology, and that anthropology is a breadth of opportunity that we're not taking up. Vast, every piece of American culture is being reinvented in real time, and we're only capturing a small part of it if we look at business anthropology. Sorry. No, that's great. That's a, I think that's a great way um, to end. So I want to first thank the panel. So we have about 15 minutes. I'm really struck by what was talked about in the earlier remarks. Oh, thank you. Okay, great. Oh, we started late. Okay. But I'm really struck by the fact that we spoke about the diminishing returns of what people are thinking about when they send a kid to college, right? That anthropology is not what's going to get them. And yet, every speaker on the panel has talked about the breadth of uh, the sort of the lateral vision, the ways that anthropologists can um, show people worldviews of various kinds of actors. And so I want to ask the panelists, what do we do from here? 
Um, and very, you know, each of you have done various ways of um, a kind of more publicly engaged kind of anthropology, whether it's um, Jillian in, in, in um, the media and, and so forth. What can we do to sort of bring ourselves outside of this room and this kind of somewhat sometimes self-reflecting kinds of things? And I understand the, the culture of contempt, but what do we do sort of to move beyond it? And I thought that we would just start with a couple of thoughts of moving forward or what you see yourselves already doing and then opening it up to a Q&A for people um, in the audience. Thoughts? Yeah, one, go ahead. Um, well, I, I actually have, I mean, to carrying on, I was actually just going to pose it to, to Jillian because I, I was thinking that, that one of the ways that anthropology has moved um, outside the academy um, profoundly has been in the tech industry. Um, I mean, with, with places like Intel um, and Google and and actually Facebook um, now all, uh, all employing them. And so I'm wondering how those things sit together with the siloing that, you're, that, that you've described, um, which sounds really resonant to me, that, but I, I see that I've seen that myself. Um, how, how it is that, that anthropology and that siloing can, can coexist or how we might um, use anthropology to break down that, uh, that, that kind of siloed thinking within technology. Well, I'm not a tech expert, but I'll say, to answer your question more broadly, Melissa, I'd say three things. Firstly, that um, I often think that the, one of the powers of anthropology is that it acts a bit like salt, in that when you add salt to food, it makes it taste a lot better, and it binds the ingredients together. And I don't mean to diminish anthropology, because it sounds a bit dismissive, but anthropology plus another ex area of expertise is fantastically powerful whether it's medicine, whether it's technology, whether it's finance or anything else. So my first point is that actually actively encouraging anthropologists to think about the plus aspect and not to regard that as setting out or diminishing what they do, but rather as carrying forward the mission and the vision is very important. Um, secondly, I, I happen to think, and I'm talking my own book here, that it's very powerful to actually tell anthropology students that it's really good and important and valuable to engage um, and that you're not always selling out and yes, there are compromises to be made but actually engaging with institutions, engaging with the public voice, engaging with frankly some of the intellectual com compromises you need to make to get a message across is actually something that actually is very important. Um, I think teaching anthropologists better communication skills um, would be helpful as well. Um, because there are some simple tricks of the trade that can be learnt to try and communicate some of the anthropology message. Um, I guess last but not least, I feel very strongly about this. I think anthropologists should stand up and be proud and hustle. Because if I look at the academic environment and the ecosystem, you know, as I said before, the skills you need to be an anthropologist, which is to listen patiently and quietly, and to take yourself out of the limelight to observe others, are central to the craft, but they're also not very helpful in terms of promoting anthropology. Economists are at the other end of the spectrum. <laughs> you know, they have profound res respect and adulation for institutions and for money, and they're all taught to hustle from about the first day they sign up on the dotted line because they're connected to the, the corridors of power. Um, psychologists have become a lot better at that recently. If you look at what, say, Danny Kahneman has done or some of the other psychologists, Historians are doing this. Um, I think anthropologists need to learn that as well. And I passionately believe that the explosion in digital um, technologies is the golden moment for that, both because it's encouraging or forcing adherents to have tunnel vision, not lateral vision, with disastrous consequences that even they can see. But secondly, as big data explodes, it's putting back on the agenda the concept of what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to study humans? Never before has that question seemed so vital in a public policy sense. And that creates a golden opportunity for anthropologists to jump in and say, we have one way to look at this. Um, so I guess um, 
sorry, <laughs> what I wanted to add is that it is, it is possible to develop uh, graduate programs in anthropology that's, that prepare students to have these kind of careers. And uh, my university, the University of North Texas, is one where, where we have developed such a program um, where we do require students to have a second discipline, for instance. Uh, we do very much emphasize the integration of theory and practice, so we want to prepare them for practice. We give them a lot of applied projects during their time, but we also emphasize theory. Um, and, um, and we also try to give them some professional development so that they are, you know, they have like those basic workplace skills. Um, and if I may, um, could I ask our students and alumni and faculty from UNT to raise your hands? So, <laughs> it works. <laughs> There's always room for improvement, of course. I think Grant had something to add. Here, I'll use both of these. Um, for me, the first order of business here is to take an oath of humility of the kind somebody, forgive me, I forget who raised that issue of humility early. But too often when I hear anthropologists talking about what they have to bring to the study of contemporary culture or to business is this presumption that they know better. That for moral, political, epistemological reasons, they are gifted with certain understandings that give them a position of superiority. If, if somebody went off to a more conventional field site and tried to pull this, tried to construct this superordination, we'd say, off with your head. You can't be an anthropologist. That violates the first principle of your engagement. But we do it routinely when it comes to the study of our own culture. Um, so that feels to me like, um, here's the deal. We don't know better. We don't know better because nobody knows anything especially well. That's, for me, one of the things you learn about going inside the corporate world, the business world. Everybody is, remember that book Contiki that we all read as kids? Where they'd reinvent the boat as they cr crossed the Pacific. That's every organization. That's every community. That's every family. That's every self. People are a continual act of improv. They're, they're trying to figure things out. And if that's the case, it helps not at all for us to, to swan in and say, leave it to us, we know what's going on here or how you ought to conduct yourselves. I think humility is not just sort of called for as a general principle and not just as an anthropological kind of principle. It's called for because of the field site in which we now live where all hell is breaking loose all the time. Want to take a minute? Um, do we need the mics to follow through or come up? That, if we can circulate the mics. Circulate the mic? Okay. If you would just introduce yourself and your affiliation if you want, and a brief question so that we don't have to lose these, just briefly. Yeah, I actually want to ask you a question. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah, it'll be brief. Uh, no, um, I think you might. I'm sorry, I, I'm all discombobulated. Racine Brown, I'm an independent consultant uh, in Tampa doing work for a couple startups, uh, tech startups as it happens. But um, I had a question, you know, I think you make a great point about humility, but how do you balance, if you're trying to like get a job or do consulting gigs, how do you balance the deep need for humility with the tactical need to be impressive and for people to pay attention to you? Yeah, it's a great point. For client purposes, you are a fount of wisdom. Um, and you're, you're, you're often wrong, but you're never in doubt. And it's really the kind of stand and deliver stuff, like you can trust me, I know exactly what I'm saying. That kind of force took me a long, as a Canadian, <clears throat> um, so it took me a long time to master that, but boy, is it essential. And wishing makes it so, in an interesting sort of way, right? Acting that out actually does give some kind of credibility to the, the argument. Oh, sorry. Forget my um, responsibility. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say something too, which is that. Um, oh, is this? Okay, it's on. Um, which is to, to say to, to, to take your, our, our anthropological expertise to the project of expert knowledge. So, I mean, if you, if you can analyze um, the corporate culture, that means especially thinking about how expert knowledge is functioning. So, in fact, you, it, with that knowledge, you can construct yourself as an expert. You, you make yourself into the expert that they, that they need you to be, which doesn't mean, um, you know, being naive about what you're doing, but actually to be reflexive about, about the fact that 
everyone is doing that, and that your, your own understanding of your own position um, will help you understand what other people in the business are also doing. Uh, yeah, can yeah, I go ahead? Go ahead. I think I can that? project, yeah. Uh, my name is Jorge Vega, uh, proudly unaffiliated and between here and Berlin. Um, it's interesting to see, though, that, um, and as a follow-up to this question, uh, we're also kind of like victims of our, of our own success. And there seems to be a lot of bastardization of like the abilities that you can uh, have or wield within our organization. It happened with design thinking in the last 15 years. Now the cool new thing is like speculative fiction and speculative futures and futurism and... And if you, if you don't call yourself a futurist, well, I mean, what the hell is that, right? <laughs> so I'm wondering, you know, are there, is there a sense for how much we should almost con quality control the way that we talk about what we can actually achieve so it doesn't potentially get bastardized in a way that both backfires but also um, makes our toolkits available for antisocial uh, uses? seems to me, I, I'm, I'm not a practitioner, but I'll just jump in and say um, a couple of things. It seems to me that thinking a bit about psychology might be quite helpful because there are several levels at which you can use psychology and several levels at which you can use anthropology training. You can have an appreciation of the value of having some lateral vision and the bigger picture, which is kind of what I do in terms of my everyday journalism, is trying to look at social silences, to refer to Bourdieu and sort of see what people aren't talking about. But I wouldn't pretend for a millisecond that what we do in journalism is anthropology as we know it. Um, you can do what some businesses do, which is, or some consultants do, which is short-term projects of two, three, four months. And I know there's a constant fight inside organizations when anthropologists go in about what is defined as ethnography, not really full-blown anthropology. And I think it would be quite helpful if people said to businesses, actually, we can offer you some eth ethnography, either ethnography light or ethnography very light, where <laughs> essentially, you know, but make it clear that this is a partial use of that toolkit. Um, or there's a more fully-blown proper anthropology, which is immersive, thoughtful, long-term, slow, patient. I mean, many companies find that very frustrating and they can't actually you know, embrace that. But it also ha comes with a kind of intellectual framework too. Um, so I think drawing distinction between sort of you know, anthropological vision or principles, ethnography, light, ethnography slightly heavier, full-blown ethnography and anthropology on a sliding scale might be one way to try and explain to people the different ranges of, of ways that the toolkit can be used. Just a kind of modest suggestion from someone who's actually not a practitioner and therefore to pick up on Grant's point has no, no basis on which to say that I have complete confidence in my ideas at all. Um, so my name's Darby. I am an anthropologist, but I uh, study architecture and architectural practice. Um, so uh, I work with this, like, how do we balance the um, humility and uh, ego um, all the time. Um, and I think that um, one of the things that uh, um, architectural theorists have come to acknowledge is that we all have our expertise. And so architects may be, you know, experts in designing a building, but they are not experts in understanding the culture of the company that they're designing it for, for example. Um, and when you come to a person and you say that to them, you say, you are an expert and I am an expert. They often want to hire you because they acknowledge that you understand them more. Um, so, yeah. Um, hi, my name is Abbas. Uh, I work for Facebook. Um, I really appreciated, Jillian, your comment about trade-offs. And my question is to the entire panel. Um, I find that with emerging practicing anthropologists, we often lose them because they cannot square those trade-offs. They come in with a purism, and when it rubber meets the road, it's quite hard for them to reckon with it, especially in the long term like post two year itch I'm talking about, really keeping them in various industries over the career course. Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that 
and maybe suggestions for those of us who are trying to, you know, I be mean, supportive. I can talk to that because I really felt my whole career a little bit um, moving between, I wrote a book on Wall Street women. And as when I first gave talks, I gave talks on Wall Street, and then I went the next day and gave it to a gender studies department, and I felt, you know, conflicted, right, as an anthropologist. You know, was I critiquing capitalism? Was I not? And I think the thing that I've come to realize is that we are talking to multiple constituencies and multiple audiences. We have to think about how we're going to talk to them and translate, have different kinds of talks, different ways of producing and interacting with people, just like we would in interviews, like you said. Figuring out that, you know, if they're not, if people are going to be silent about money and families, people are going to be silent about certain things. And one of the things that I've done that's been, I think, been fairly successful is to try and have gatherings where we are almost brokering between different kinds of stakeholders, right? So in my case, having financial people meeting with academics and trying to have a kind of discussion and collaborative. I've also tried in my courses, and other people can talk about that, is to talk about the trade-offs that I might have made or felt and the kinds of issues I've had and to be pretty straightforward about that. And that it's not necessarily something that you can resolve, right? So I think that, I don't know if I did that successfully with Rachel, but maybe a little bit in the sense of saying, yeah, go and, you know, I was really happy in a sense that she was going to go do, go go on to work in Goldman Sachs, and I kept saying, just take field notes, right? Because we didn't know what was going to happen next, right? And so you don't know, right? And so it's kind of like, it's a kind of learning how to be a little bit open and, and more fluid. And I think that comes down to how we teach and also a little bit getting away from this, um, what you talked about, this hierarchy that I think is slightly embedded and maybe less, maybe generational of the applied versus the academic, right? And not giving it to the next generation as much and showing how you can move between the two. Can I say something briefly about the trade-offs, which is, you know, there are definitely trade-offs and they're tough and everyone has to make their own choices. Um, but I think that, you know, life is a marathon, not a sprint, usually. Um, in my case, I think going into the more shallow world of journalism has probably enabled me to do more to communicate anthropology ideas to a wider group than if I'd stayed in academia. Um, and, you know, it also enables sometimes surprising things happen in terms of how you can use it. I mean, in my case, I'm in a couple of weeks' time about to launch um, a whole new platform at the FT called Moral Money, which is trying to look at the world of impact investing, CSR, ESG, all the acronyms, alphabet soup. Um, and trying to basically, you know, cover what's happening to finance, which is really embedded in a wider sense of what finance is. Um, now, maybe I would have done that if I hadn't had a background in anthropology, but I suspect probably not. Um, and having a chance to use that platform is, you know, I hope very powerful in terms of maybe helping a tiny bit to shift the dial in terms of how the FD readers around the world see finance and see what how it in integrates with society and rethinks the concept of a company. Um, so, you know, life's a marathon, they, and making trade-offs can sometimes, sometimes, not always, deliver longer-term benefits, but it is a difficult journey. There's no two ways about it. The easier journey, and I'd say in some ways, the less courageous journey is to try and stay utterly pure, because you may feel pure, but actually the longer-term impact may not be as great. No, absolutely. One, one comment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, you were first. Why don't you go ahead? Can I ask? Yeah. Hi, my name is John Cho, and thank you for this wonderful panel. I teach at Davidson College in North Carolina. Uh, so I guess my question is, uh, I'm wondering if the panelists can provide a little bit of a broader contextualization of how this kind of anthropological, uh, uh, I guess this reflections on anthropology as a discipline has been navigated, some of the challenges have been navigated by other disciplines, for instance, psychology, and what are perhaps some of the challenges that they've encountered and how they've, circum um, I guess, navigated those challenges that we could perhaps learn from. So I, I think that that's a, that's a great question because I think that, that uh, like Julian said with economics, um, there's a lot that anthropology sh can and should learn from adjacent disciplines. I mean, so I think that anthropology ha starts from the premise of a kind of advocacy and that, that actually can kind of get in, get in the way of, uh, of, of studying um, kind of you know, the, 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 the capitalist world, however you want to define that. Um, uh, and that we need to kind of 
get past that idea that our, that everything that we do um, in terms of our research is about advocating for the people that we're studying, right? I mean, we can be advocating for anthropological principles um, without actually advocating for the, for, you know, I mean, to be very crude about it, um, you know, the, like, capitalist oppressors. That, 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 is, that is a distinction that really, really needs to be made. Because I think when, when, when um, psychologists, um, are certainly economists, but, but say, behavioral e economists, go into a company to advise, which they do all the time, right, because that is actually, like Julian was saying, part of the field is the, is the hustle. Anthropologists have to, have to learn that, that we can and, and should be doing that in order to start to uh, start to 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 expand the vision of of these uh, of these corporations that that this idea that we are going to um, be ad necessarily advocating for the positions that exist um, is is I mean first of all it's, it's a it's a it's a quite a um, sort of one only one strand of what anthropology ever was and did but it somehow become in a kind of post uh, post 2000s moment, um, the the way that we that we tend to think about anthropology. But I think that that if we can get past that idea of advocacy, we're going to be able to do uh, much more uh, in the way of bringing anthropological perspectives, which is exactly what these other disciplines already do. And um, so. There is quite a body of research that I sort of briefly alluded to on how different disciplines, um, how the relationship of theory and practice works out in other disciplines, and each has a very different history. And um, so again, Donald Stokes' um, book, he has a book called Pasteur's Quadrant, which is a really nice kind of exploration of that. Um, and I think anthropology could, could usefully learn from those examples. Um, I also just wanted to go back to Bas's question. Um, so I do think that universities, many anthropology departments could do a better job of preparing students for like setting their expectations of what does it mean to work in the business world that it's not just like, well, I didn't get a job in academia, so let me just hop into the business world, but that, <laughs> that you know, just to know more of like, what will that life be like? And, and there are resources out there that are available. So, um, so in one of the classes I teach where we kind of go over those kind of things, um, I draw on um, a Napa Bulletin from 2006 that I edited, which has about 10 women um, practitioners telling their life story. So kind of in a feminist way, weaving together like the personal and the professional dimensions of their lives about, and how theory and practice play out. And, and those are really useful stories that students really benefit from reading. And also um, in that class, I also have maybe five to eight visitors who are practitioners who, again, just sort of in front of the class tell their stories. Um, and, and students really benefit a lot from being exposed to those examples, I think. Yeah, I, I actually just wanted to add, another thing that I've done, and I have somebody here in the audience that we've done together, is to um, have, to have for somebody from business come in and co-teach a course or a class, right? And so Rhea Davis, who um, is from, uh, worked on Wall Street and is pre executive director of the FWA, has come into my class. And so there are lots of ways to get students to have different kinds of positions and to see people not always agree. We have to wrap up, but my sense is that we've just begun to scratch the surface. I really do want to say you something. You really want to say something. We're, going to, we're not going to, one minute to wrap up. Go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to uh, suggest that uh, as anthropologists, we also need to take uh, understanding the business community as an ethnographic project in general. Uh, and one of the ways that I've found that is really very, advant very uh, advantageous, a very easy way to do this, is to join professional business associations in your community. I belong to five. I belong to the Product Design Management Association. I belong to the User Experience Management Association, the Minnesota, uh, Minnesota uh, sorry, Marketing Association, our local Advertising uh, Bureau, and uh, what's the fifth one? Um, oh, it's a, it's a uh, and also our, um, uh, the Medical Device uh, Mad uh, Management Association, which is uh, something special to Minnesota. Uh, these uh, organizations are social organizations. They usually have meetings once a month with a speaker. They cost almost nothing to join. Uh, and it is, a, it is a, and a terrific way to go and, and tell people 
what you do. Uh, and uh, for me, this is practical as well, because in my uh, business anthropology course, I have students doing projects in the community. That's where practically I get all of my projects uh, are from, uh, from people at these associations. It's very, it's very pleasant, very easy, and also it's a, a kind of a mitzvah for, uh, for anthropology to do that kind of networking. Um, just one quick yeah. point to, mm -hmm. is this on? It is on. Uh, to build on what you were saying, but to go the other way. Um, I think you should make friends with people in business schools. Um, and, um, um, uh, and, and I know it's hard. We have a dean of a business school here. Uh, a few of us teach in business schools. And um, it, it seems to me that business schools are uh, teaching some of what we should be teaching. Um, they don't know it when they're doing it, um, so we can help them. We can also learn from them. Look at how marketing research is taught. Look at how design is taught. Look at how organizational culture is taught in business schools. It can be edifying. It's very different, talking about silos. Um, but it's really important for us not only to read some of the articles that they write, but also to get to know those schools and, and their curricula, and maybe even some people there, and collaborate with them from time to time. Can I have just one sentence? Almost all, virtually all of the people in business school had undergraduate degrees in some form of social science. So it's not like they're it's not like they're alien to us. Yeah. They 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 know what we're talking about. It's just that uh, you haven't made the effort, and usually they're very. So I want to, I just really want to thank the panelists because I think we've generated a really interesting conversation and just scratched the surface. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hope you had a break. So after this, we will break for lunch. And I think the weather is holding out nicely. We have a beautiful garden area. You can take your lunch, your box, lunch, your box, I need. So uh, but we have a, before that, we have a really great panel here. I'm pleased to introduce um, this panel called Anthropology at Work Using Our Toolkit to Tackle the Toughest Business Challenges. So we've had, we, we know about anthropology, uh, how that it's no longer how anthropologists, what they do for business. It's really, the question is now, how do anthropologists add value? And that's really what this, uh, this next panel is going to be about. How do they add value and, and communicate value and leverage networks? And leading this is going to be Derek Newberry. He was adjunct professor in anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. And wow, I just learned that he's at the Boston Consulting Group. And he's uh, building up, building practices out for the Boston Consulting Group. So please welcome this next session. And uh, Derek will take it from here. Great, thank you. You know, glad to be uh, joining on the heels of uh, what was, a, I think, a really lively and engaging discussion this morning. You know, what I would say about this panel is as we were thinking about sort of the theme, it, it just occurred to me that it seems like every few years, like clockwork, there's an article in, you know, The Atlantic or New York Times, one of these publications, that kind of purports to discover, as though for the very first time, that there are actually anthropologists in the business world, right? <laughs> And I think it's sort of ironic that oftentimes these authors almost take on the tone or persona of like a Margaret Mead who are discovering this strange remote tribe of anthropologists in the workplace with these bizarre behaviors. There are always things like, did you know they actually just sit around and watch people do stuff and <laughs> Intel pays them? Can you believe it, right? So I think I, I really appreciate that, you know, that we, we read stuff like this and I think we appreciate the attention, but uh, much like those long lost tribes that some of our anthropological predecessors studied, we kind of have the feeling like, hey, we've been here, we've been doing this, right? And that's sort of the premise of this panel, that um, we're already in sort of diverse sectors and diverse roles all over the business world, but that we don't really have a venue to share ideas, to share best practices, to, to connect with each other and really build a community of practice. And so that's sort of the focus uh, today. And what you'll see here, and one of the reasons I think this is so difficult, is that oftentimes we don't, you know, usually I would say we don't carry the title anthropologist in, in our official role, right? It's kind of, you can see it in our, the degree in our LinkedIn bios or in how we describe our work. But unless your name is Martha Bird, you don't have the official title of business anthropologist. Martha's special, the rest of us, you're not so. Uh, and so, so the idea here is we're going to try to do three things. Um, first, uh, share some of those success stories and experiences we've had as practitioners in the business world. Uh, second, think about how we talk about our work. 
in a way that resonates with our colleagues. And I, I appreciate that at the end of the last panel, we had a lot of very practically oriented questions, like how do I actually talk about what I do? Uh, that's what we're going to be focused on here. And third, think about a little bit of, you know, how can we build this community of practice? So to demonstrate sort of the diversity of anthropologists, you know, working in, in different sectors in the business world, um, we'll see a little bit of that diversity here uh, when we do panel introductions. And why don't we go a little bit deeper in addition to talking about your role, uh, if we could just briefly talk a little bit about how anthropology has informed our role. I think that would be helpful for all of us. So please, Kaylee, go for it. Is this on? Okay, okay great. Uh, so, Kaylee Wilson, uh, I'm a director of research strategy at WeWork, and uh, unlike many of my esteemed colleagues and many of you, I don't have a super in-depth background in anthropology. I studied some medical anthropology in college, some of cultural anthropology, but truthfully, I'm quite a mutt, um, and it's served me very well in the career that I've chosen and some of the kind of meandering paths that I've taken. Um, so I do a little bit of anthropology, a little bit of sociology, a little bit of psychology, even a little bit of economics. I know we're, we're hitting hard on, econ on economists these days, but um, all these different things that come to the process of answering questions in a really different way. And my current role is all about advocating for all of those different ways to answer questions. So I, I hire anthropologists, I hire sociologists, I hire behavioral economists, and my job is to understand what value they uniquely bring to each business context and to go into the business context and advocate for that strongly. Um, so for me, that kind of diverse background has been really essential to kind of understanding there's so many ways to view this world. <laughs> um, yeah. Hi, I'm Terry McKinley. I'm an executive director at Frog Design. Uh, we are a design company, and I've been there for about 15 years. Uh, my background also, like yours, is I have an undergraduate degree in cultural and symbolic anthropology. Um, but from that base, I moved into uh, working at MIT in the dot-com days, and uh, then went back and got an MFA from Parsons in design and technology. So for me, the practice of anthropology really is the foundation for how I approach what it means to design. And um, I think anthropology for me has been the foundation of empathy and realizing that you can go from an understanding of individual to asking what does that mean about society, what does that mean about the culture, and design as asking how can I now have impact, design as the act of making something. So for me, the combination of the two is very natural. The company I work for, Frog, has kind of a founding idea that form should follow emotion, and for me, that has been a belief that I cannot design for the emotion if I don't understand the individual that underlies it. But over a 15-year career, what that's meant has been that my first sort of area of practice development at Frog was design research. But then realizing that we design great products for customers that we understand, but because we're a consultancy, if our client doesn't share that understanding with us, the product often doesn't get to market or doesn't get to market as it should. So my second area of practice development for the company was participatory design and co-creation. How do we bring the customer and the client together into the process of design? And then as design has changed, we no longer design just a product or just a service. We design experiences that seek to transform the relationship between our clients and their customers. So we design experiences today. And for me, what that has meant is that often, as a designer, I need to be looking at the shape of the client's organization, how they think about their customers, the processes, the tools they use to be able to design both their organization and sometimes the employee experience to be able to impact that customer experience. So it's been an interesting journey, and anthropology, I think, underlies how I look at the problems holistically. Hi, my name is Tom Moscow, and um, I began my career uh, as sort of a, um, a traditional uh, anthropologist, academic anthropologist. I spent a couple of years in Papua New Guinea, 
uh, studying religion, symbolism, ceremonialism, uh, song poetry, <laughs> and uh, systems of kinship and exchange uh, in a previously un or not unanthropologically studied people. So <laughs> it's kind of the holy grail of um, classical and traditional anthropological endeavor. Um, for the past 20 years, I've kind of operated as, I guess the word is, as we've been discussing, a business anthropologist. I didn't quite know what that meant or what I was doing. I just thought I was always, uh, just to reference Grant McCracken, I was just doing anthropology. <laughs> I was using the toolkit of, of anthropology, uh, the, the ideas and theories to, in, that I learned and uh, used in, to interpret my Papua New Guinea ethnography, to interpret con, uh, human behavior in, uh, in, in uh, the economic kind of projects that I was involved with. So I'm just discovering that I'm a business anthropologist, so that's good. Um, that so really intense, I'd be proud. I'm, <laughs> I, I first, first the identity and then the pride, but I have to. I, um, so the reason I'm kind of pinch hitting on this uh, dais because uh, Chris so flies from, from Google. Yeah, uh, fell ill over the weekend, so okay. unfortunately Tom was able to send him. So I guess uh, Tim Malafite heard the word Google and thought of me immediately. So I've done uh, about seven projects now for, for Google, and I guess we can talk about that a little bit. But um, I think the moment we're in um, now is I think we have to reassert the value of the human experience of commerce uh, in an age of obsession with digital tools of automation and uh, digital tools of research. Uh, and I, that's kind of what I've been doing. And I guess we'll, we can talk a little bit about that as the, 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 the session goes on. Uh. Hi, uh, I'm Martha Bird. And yes, I, I do have a title as business anthropologist. I'm very happy about that. I will preface this by saying, though, that internally, in terms of the systems and the way um, the people get paid, there are things called job families and job classes, and there's this whole system behind the scenes for um, uh, human capital management software, which is the business I'm actually in at the moment, uh, where I'm in a job family in uh, user research. So it's an interesting, um, I've had uh, discussions with the um, CHRO of the company. It's a Fortune 250 company, so it's not, you know, I'm not just going down the hall to talk to somebody who's managing 10 people and said, you know, we really need to get a new job class uh, for me. Uh, and with 60,000 employees, I don't think I'm on the top of the list. Um, but still, I think it, it goes to show that these discussions are coming up. And the other thing I'll point out, which I think is extraordinary, is that we have Turi and Derek on this. So the three of us out of, out of the, what, five, um, I've connected with in the last three weeks by pure serendipity. Mm -hmm. So I'm working with a group at um, BCG um, on, a, on a, one project and with Frog Design on another one. So, you know, I don't know what the likelihood of that number of us con for con converging here is, but I'm astounded by it. And I would like to say that uh, I, part of the pleasure um, for me of doing what I do is that I feel deeply um, grateful to be in places like this, uh, to be able to think the thoughts that I am able to think and to share them with people who I think probably generally have a, a like disposition. And so I thank you all for being part of, of my life in this and, and simply to say that I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, I started off, um, I got into anthropology sort of, um, I, fo I was following the money. Um, and so I, I actually started off um, studying um, art theory and criticism uh, in Chicago and then went on um, to receive a fellowship uh, in sociology with a, a then rather famous guy um, who got me lined up for lots of money. And I wrote something um, that he dis disapproved of after some time together. Um, and so we, we, got, we, we got a divorce. And I was cast, I was cast out, um, and I had to find a home. Uh, so anthropologists tend to be pretty welcoming people, and they said, Martha, Martha, come, come, come. <laughs> so, you know, three years into to, to graduate work, I switched from sociology to anthropology, and um, 
and I, and I never looked back, except to say that pa parallel to working on my PhD, um, I did research um, on Native uh, American um, uh, gaming and gambling and, um, and economic development. Uh, so I do have some sort of history um, between um, sort of the notion of the business of culture, um, the culture of business, um, the heritage industry, and, um, and, and all of the sort of um, uh, nexes that those um, suggest, and I find myself in um, today. So it's sort of parallel to doing the um, anthropology degree, I was a farmer, and I had anticipated being a farmer and not being an academic and not being a business anthropologist. Um, and so I'm used to being in a space where people say, uh, so you have a PhD, uh, so why are you a farmer? Um, you uh, are in business, so why aren't you an academic? So the good news is I'm able to sort of like uh, sort of avoid all of that because I'm, I think I've become uh, I'm immune to the um, arrows and, and have found, um, as I think several people have already expressed, um, uh, that, that for me um, to be able to occupy a space where I make local, I think impactful, um, um, you know, contribution uh, to a mindset uh, is extremely re rewarding. And, you know, hopefully in the course of our discussion, I can share with you a little bit more of, of why that is for me. Well, a couple of thoughts here. First of all, I have to say, I've never heard anyone say that they uh, pursued anthropology because they were following the money. That's so <laughs> definitely a first. <laughs> My parents certainly didn't think so. But, uh, <laughs> but I think two, two themes I noticed here. One is the word serendipity. Uh, that used Martha. So I think about that in two ways. One, you noted that you know, many of us just met or spoke for the first time you know, a few weeks or a couple of months ago. So when I said earlier that many of us don't have the title anthropologist and to find us you have to kind of go into LinkedIn and look at, degree, look at degrees and how we describe ourselves in our bio, that's because I literally had to do that to put this uh, panel together. Because I wanted to co sort of go beyond the, the known community and bring people in who have our mindset, our perspective, our toolkit, but maybe you didn't know that there's this community of practice out there. So I'd like to get us to think a little bit about, you know, how we can go from serendipity to a little bit more sort of intentionality, right? And building these connections. Also serendipity related to that in that you know, we find ourselves in these career paths in these sort of unexpected ways. So just note that as well. The other thing I think, uh, the other theme that, that cross cuts these, these really wonderful introductions is that of being people centered, right? Um, that seems to be a common, you know, desire or intent in our work that we really want to be people-centered. Now that can mean a lot of things, and I know that's uh, a focus of the work of many of the people in this room as well. So I think one question on my mind is, what does that mean in our organizations right now? And so what I'm getting at is, I think we have a great opportunity here with these practitioners to think about what are some really cutting-edge things you're doing right now to use the anthropology toolkit perspective in your own work. So. You know, if you could just share an example or, or a story of a really innovative, innovative way in which you're using that toolkit, I think we could all benefit. A project you're working on, something like that. Um, this is a project I worked on a, a few years ago, um, and it was for a, not, not my current employer. Um, I was uh, then living in London, and I was working for um, the largest online uh, global uh, e-commerce platform. I'm not sure that it still holds that title, but at the time it did. Um, I was um, asked to sort of understand the different potential markets that we might um, occupy uh, with, a, with a global platform. So um, there were several identified, and so I spent time in, in various places. And, and as part of this exercise, um, what I, uh, I was very fortunate um, that there was an appetite for it and also um, the budget. I said, you know, I think for us to understand these spaces that we want to try to, uh, to, to be in, we should really understand um, the local people, not just as end users of a global platform. And so uh, we would convene what I, you know, these sort of, uh, you know, uh, panels in these various um, countries. And what I, what I did, and, I, and it really, I thought, was extremely helpful was um, to ask each of the participants of the local uh, people that were on these panels to bring an object um, that they felt was best 
a dis that was the most resonant for them in terms of their, their home culture. And so to tell a story, so we'd have all of the people coming in from, you know, San Jose at that time, um, and and then this the the panelists, and then just say, you know, ask about, um, you know, how this object relates to their culture. And I remember one in particular that was so touching to me. I mean, they uh, they all were. I'm, I'm kind of a, you know, I'm kind of into that stuff. Um, but there, there was one man in Denmark uh, in Copenhagen who brought a bunch of licorice. And he shared it with, you know, like, you know, 65 uh, executives from Silicon Valley and also described, um, you know, what, what that was for him. And um, I feel like, you know, to me, that's a great, that's a great um, way that, you know, an anthropological mindset can, you know, help to create bridges that wouldn't otherwise be there. All right. <laughs> I, I'll kind of um, bounce off of what you were talking about, Martha. I think um, for me, the shift from the design team focusing on the user to bringing the, um, the client into that, one of the moments that really um, continues to stand out in my mind uh, with that was I was working with a health insurance company um, and within this health insurance company there is uh, most of them have them they have some version of a clinical guidance organization which is where they are um, thinking about the win-win when there's a very expensive patient somebody who has multiple conditions things like that um, that they will provide additional services to help that person um, adhere to their medical regime or whatever else it is that will keep them healthier in part because it means that they are then less expensive to the health insurance company. Um, but there is this potential win-win. So we were working with them um, as some new types of health programs were coming out and they wanted to um, understand what the impacts would be of these new health programs. Uh, the challenge was that everybody in the clinical guidance organization was a physician and they understood what adhering to your drug regimen, what adhering to your plan meant, and if you don't do that, you are obviously doing something wrong, right? If you don't do what your doctor tells you, you're making a mistake. So there was kind of an inherent um, antipathy and unwillingness to understand some of the behaviors they were quantitatively observing in the population of people that they served. So we brought together, um, I had these doctors make sure that they dressed in their Sunday clothes, you know, not, nothing fancy, but we went uh, and brought together over a dinner. We did a design dinner. Um, we had people sit next to each other and have a conversation over dinner. It was lightly facilitated and moderated. But one of the conversations that I overheard and that became um, pretty, pretty much of a mind shift for this um, physician who was the head of this organization was, he was sitting next to a woman, um, or a man, but a woman who um, was describing to him why she didn't stick to her drug regimen. She had a heart condition. Um, her husband also had a condition, and both of them had a medication that they needed to take every day. But they couldn't afford it. So they had decided between themselves that he would get his pill one day and she would get her pill the next day. Um, it was just one story, but he understood it, and he was able to grasp it. And again and again throughout the relationship that I had with this health insurance company, this story came up. In the beginning, it was just the head of the organization, but over time, you saw that story, that empathy, that understanding of why people make bad decisions um, begin to come uh, become sticky within the organization. And I think that is the power of individual experience, but also for us as designers, we had to build into that dialogue within the company the what next. Because if you just stop there and you say, wow, that's terrible, nothing really changes. So part of our design work was to identify that framework and build the design solutions um, 
to tie to that story. So, a couple of things. Um, so what I do mostly at WeWork and what a lot of my career has been focused on is studying the way people work. Um, we study how people conceptualize the workspace, the, what their mental models are for the workspace, and then really kind of just the nitty gritty of how the habits and behavior kind of collide to create all those fun tensions we all know so well. Um, and so one, uh, one project we've done recently, uh, there's a general shift in the workspace industry about moving away from assigned desks. Um, it's been going on for 20 some years in Europe. America's a little late to the game. There's a lot of tension, a lot of questions, a lot of very angry and unhappy people about it. And so when we came in, we were kind of, you know, we were asked, like, okay, we'll, we'll figure out how to, how to make this happen because the efficiency gains are too good to ignore. Um, and so we, well, we asked, well, what do you think the, the meaning of the desk is? Why do people, why do people like their desk? Why do people want their desk? How do people use their desks? Um, and they showed me some survey results, and it was mostly, I need it to do my work. And you're like, well, okay, let's go a little deeper. Um, and so one of the projects we did is we started doing really site visits to desks. Um, and we started capturing, doing really kind of a categorization and a cataloging of what things people have at their desks that we can understand and look at in order to figure out what are the rituals, what are the things and objects people are imbuing with meaning, and kind of how are people showing up at their desk, um, and what can we learn from that in order to construct a clear mental model of what a desk means to individuals. So to Martha's point, if we do need to move forward with a new model, because the efficiency gains are real and real estate's getting more and more expensive and so many other reasons I can talk about, but how do you, instead of just saying we're gonna get rid of this thing, how do you re look at the underlying system of value and create something new that supports that system of value um, so that the essential human need is still addressed, even if it's addressed by a new solution that is no longer a personally owned desk. Um, and we found out lots of interesting things which have started to inform some of the decisions that are being made. Um, I think some of the most interesting ones are really around how desks create uh, anchoring, specifically in a workplace that is consistently in most companies getting more and more chaotic. Fewer and fewer things uh, continue as planned. More and more work is interrupted. Uh, fewer and fewer things are predictable. And so there's this real sense of it being an anchoring point. And so then the design challenge based on that becomes how do you create other anchoring points in a system we know is going to continue like entropy. It's just gonna get crazier and crazier. Um, but this can't be the anchor point forever. We have to find out something new. So, and by kind of understanding that and kind of unpacking what the role of an anchor point is and how often people had to visit the anchor point. And when they visited it, what were the things they were doing? What were the rituals they were performing around their anchoring point that made them feel settled, that made them feel confident and sure? And so then we kind of launched a design project in response to that. Uh, one of the other, like I said, in my career I've been doing less and less research myself and more and more trying to build the infrastructure mindsets and methods that help our company do research. Um, and at WeWork, one of the things we have that's really interesting is every single one of our co-working spaces is essentially run by a group that we call our community team. Um, and they're kind of a blend of hospitality and facilities maintenance, and they, they do everything. If any of you have ever worked in a WeWork, they're amazing. They're like the best people in the world. Um, but when I got to WeWork, there was a lot of conversation around this being an untapped source of wisdom. And so we started looking into it, and we saw that oh, time and time again, uh, the efforts that were made to channel that wisdom had failed. And so we started looking at why, and we kind of dug into uh, basically the different feedback mechanisms that have been created, you know, a, a survey that they could go into and be like, I'm seeing this, I'm seeing this, this is my observation. Um, and then design would pick it up on the other end, and for design, which is kind of used to, especially as they've had more and more relationships with research, is kind of used to getting these like nicely packaged reports that have these like pretty little insights in them. Um, design wasn't picking it up. What the wisdom the community was bringing seemed fragmented, 
it wasn't representing a, a system of problems. It was kind of one-off observations. And so one of the things we've been piloting uh, is taking our community team, which is thousands and thousands of people, usually at a slightly lower level in the company, you know, so starting point at WeWork, um, and we've been putting them through a, a pilot training them in the basics of observational research and inductive reasoning. And uh, I'm going to put this out here. We are actually also looking for partners to help in that training. Um, but it's something that we've just started doing. And that idea of bringing that kind of toolkit to the average person on the front line and giving them both the, uh, the opportunity to move forward in their career, it's a great toolkit to have, but also making sure that they have the skills so the people who have the eyes on the product and on the user at all points in time actually have the skill set to translate that into something that is useful for design. Okay, um, so <clears throat> I guess I should talk about this tech stuff. Uh, so one of the um, projects, or actually a series of projects I've been involved with is uh, something called um, by Google, not by me, um, humanizing digital. Um, so Google, of course, is a great technical company, it supposedly knows everything um, uh, about us. Uh, but for all its um, user experience studies and for all its uh, tracking of consumer um, uh, journeys um, on the online space, uh, the quotidian meaning of what people were about uh, was there, some people in Google uh, realized that that meaning was escaping them. Um, I don't quite know how they got to me, uh, but they came to my consultancy, and um, so I have a contact I've been working with for years and years, and she got a job there. I guess that's how they got to me. And um, so we've done um, about seven or eight projects now in this uh, endeavor. Um, these projects have been about anything from uh, the meaning of visual imagery on the digital space and what memes mean and why people, uh, what satisfactions people get out of uh, exchanging pictures and videos uh, to a more recent project on virtual reality uh, to how uh, journalists, uh, what kind of digital tools would be useful in uh, uh, a newsroom today and why do journalists keep uh, uh, rejecting what Google is making for them? Um, uh, so I went into a bunch of newsrooms and tried to study journalistic practice and uh, tried to give Google some idea of uh, what, what, more, what tools might be more amenable uh, for, for their journalistic practice. Um, but I guess um, the project in this series of projects that really stands out for me is um, a project on virtual reality, which uh, which we've we completed uh, about a year ago, it was a six-month study, and um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with virtual reality. If you've ever been in one of these strange headsets <laughs> or walked around in a green field, uh, but it's been kind of the next new big thing for the last 20 years. But it's never really <laughs> taken off, and. Um, one of its iterations, or um, uh, hopeful, people were thinking, in journalism anyway, that um, because of the immersive quality of this medium, um, this might be a way to tell journalistic stories in a way that really revives aspects of journalism and hooks people into um, a greater degree of interest. Um, and um, so Google, in one of its pro bono uh, incarnations or arms, uh, gave some money to, uh, and also the Knight Foundation, gave some money to a bunch of uh, journalists uh, and started this association called 360 Journalism, which works with immersive technologies to try to construct journalistic stories. Uh, the trouble is that those guys didn't really know what virtual reality was or what the experience was that it gave people, or um, what vocabulary to use even to talk about any of that. Um, so they 
they came to me uh, and said, let's see what the anthropologists can do. Uh, so I, I spent a lot of time getting a little bit nauseous at times, putting on these headsets and um, getting a little motion sick. But uh, I experienced, along with um, <coughs> consumers, early adopters of this technology, I experienced, along with them, um, you know, what it's like to construct a, uh, a solar system and have that solar system explode when, you, when a, a comet enters it and, uh, or a sun goes supernova and be there in that green field and see and experience a sense of scale that virtual reality can give you. That, that program is called the Cosmic Sandbox. Um, but I also was in uh, situations, there's a New York Times uh, has done a series of uh, works. Uh, Marcel Hopkins uh, leads the 360 unit at the New York Times and um, she's done a bunch of things on the Iraq war. One is called Fight for Fallujah and I was in a headset in the middle of a battle and completely surrounded by uh, bullets coming at me and people screaming and um, I was with, in that space with um, early adopters of the technology and trying to elicit from them as I was experiencing that, you know, what was going on there and what they were feeling and seeing during a sort of virtual um, uh, participant of observation and questioning. Anyway, so that went on for quite some time. And um, to get a long-winded way, but I'm getting to it. Um, uh, we needed at least, as anthropologists often do when they write their ethnographies, an organizing metaphor to make sense of this. And um, I kept hearing people say about the sense of presentism. Um, that when they were in that moment, it was like they were, they were there. They were, it's like being there. The Jersey Kaczynski book, uh, if you've read that, but just being there in that moment, there was no, in the piece, The Fight for Fallujah, there was no thinking about the sociopolitical uh, connotations of the battle. You were just there in that moment and um, completely sort of participating in the scene. Um, it was as if you were not hearing a story, but living a story. Um, and the journalists had to get that idea, I think, um, that what they were doing, and the best way to leverage this new technical medium was to deliver an experience, not to tell a story, and uh, to let these folks live the story that you're telling. Put them there in that place. And um, so in Papua New Guinea, um, there are storytellers, and when they tell stories, they perform the stories as if they're participating in them. And there are various terms in the Melanesian literature, a lived myth, um, uh, I guess there's one that comes on to mind, or lived story. So I, I, re I reached back for that analogy, that organizing metaphor, and I had experienced this in New Guinea. I had lived that story before, and that helped me uh, communicate to the client what was going on with this new technology and how people were experiencing it and using it. And from that, we developed a bunch of storytelling guideposts for journalists to use as they experimented with this new technology. So it's kind of the anthropologist working in concert with the client to build out the vocabulary of a new technology. And um, and then apply it. And then so Google went on, they developed all these shops uh, where they would have journalists come in and they would uh, give them story uh, telling guideposts or story construction guideposts uh, about how to do stories in this new medium. So that's kind of, um, and you know, I know Julian Tent was talking about the, the, the tunnel vision of technology companies and they do have that, but sometimes they recognize that they do have that and they, they reach out. Um. Yeah. So um, I think one sort of theme that, that brings all these different examples together is that of, um, you, so we talked about the importance of being people-centered, but here you have some, some very specific examples of sort of bringing the client very close to the customer or to the user experience in such a way as it, it kind of creates these moments of almost like hard-hitting impact where they really get for a, a moment 
what that person's experience is like, what their lives are like, what their sort of fears and desires are. To me, it's amazing that we don't do this more often or outside of this field because organizations at, and customers, all of this stuff, really comes down to relationships between people, and I think that often gets lost to the degree where we oftentimes miss some really obvious things, right? So a great example from just a couple of days ago in my own work at BCG, we've been helping a client go through a large-scale cultural transformation. This is an industrial goods uh, manufacturing company. And I'll just call the initiative Refresh. You know, it's been called Refresh, and we're branding Refresh, and we're going to communicate it from headquarters all over the place. So as part of this, we were uh, putting together a leadership development program for plant managers so they can sort of better enact Refresh in their own parts of the organization. And we had this call with our team on the ground and said, we kind of assumed, okay, this program's going to be all about getting them to, to do refresh and we'll talk about that. And the team on the ground said, folks, just stop for one second. Nobody here has heard of refresh. Just start with that. Nobody knows what this is. This is something that came from headquarters. This has nothing to do with their day-to-day -day lives. You know, we have to start with, you know, what is their actual experience? What, what do they know? Sort of what is their world? BCG being what it is, we were, you know, that afternoon we were already booking travel to every single plant and the company, we realized that we needed to visit all these places to really understand what their lives were like um, and build a model of leadership development from a day in their lives out to the general skills they needed rather than the other way around. But I think, you know, one sort of, sort of one common sort of driving compulsion amid all these examples is this desire to build empathy, right? And I think we're all in this line of work because to some degree we have a lot of empathy for those, you know, customers, clients, users. And so that brings us to one challenge. You know, earlier I think somebody was asking about trade-offs in the last panel. And I think a really crucial trade-off we often face is that when we're communicating the value of our work, right, we sometimes face this tension where we feel like we have to oversimplify, you know, the customer, the user, to the client in order to communicate to them in a way that's going to, to resonate. Or even worse, sometimes we have to feel, we feel like we're compelled to talk about them in ways that are even kind of alienating, to use one of those $5 academic words we were talking about, Kaylee, right? <laughs> you know, so when you're faced with that, with that difficulty of like, okay, I need to make a connection with the client and get them to, you know, uh, get on board with this idea or new product, but I'm, it comes into tension with how I feel like I have to represent or maybe even misrepresent the customer, how do you deal with situations like that? Um, and this is an interesting question because there's, there's working with your, uh, for me it's the client, for some of you it's a colleague, right? Uh, there's working with your client to help them understand uh, and help them have empathy. Ultimately, as a designer, as somebody who's there to help make something happen, you want to get them to the next step, right? So finding those arguments, the things that work, is super valuable. Um, but I think, I feel like increasingly I have to be sensitive to what works and the underlying story that it tells. So for me, one of the ones that often works uh, when you are talking about why should we do customer-facing research, why should that doctor build empathy with, with patients, things like that, uh, it's because we will, um, we will avoid more costly mistakes further down the line, right? Or we will build the product right to begin with. Um, but the challenge with using that story, even though it works and even though you can find proven examples where we avoided, by doing this research now, we avoided having to do a bunch of development rework later. Um, the challenge is it still organizationally goes back to the numbers are primary. The, the sort of that, that um, the total cost of developing this product is what's most important, rather than framing the problem in the customer relationship. So I've been trying to find um, with my customers or with my clients, uh, what are those stories that help them uh, speak about the benefit to the user within the shape of the business and with the benefit to the business? Um, but not kind of fall back on those tropes of um, just, you know, it's going to make the bottom line better. I think we have to be sensitive to the underlying mindset that we're building. I, I, I think that's right on. Um, I think one of the things that I, I was thinking about on, on the um, train in from 
uh, New Jersey this morning was about this whole notion of operationalizing empathy. And I think, you know, we're, we're really pulling out this empathy word a lot. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm still not exactly sure what it is, right? Um, I, you know, it, it strikes me that it's in some, in some contexts, empathy is about, okay, I, I, I understand what they want and, and let's, we, we need to make that happen. Um, but, but I feel like we need to maybe get a little more sophisticated or a little more mindful or a little bit more concentrated on words like empathy because I think underneath the surface of it there's probably a lot more going on and I wish I had like the answer. I don't. I, I'm, I'm, I'm shirking my responsibility and throwing it out to everybody. But yeah, I'm kind of interested in um, this, this idea of empathy. Getting back to the practical matters, though, um, for me, one of the things that has been um, super helpful is, you know, I basically try to focus on the artifactual, the material culture things that are, are meaningful to, to the people that I'm, that I'm working with. So let's call it an Excel sheet. It could be that. That's an interesting tool. That has a whole history. That has a history around spatiality, a history around rationality, around grids. Uh, and it also has a history around expertise and knowledge acquisition. And, you know, I think you can tell really interesting stories about, um, about these tools to the people who have grown up using them and the people who may, in fact, need to uh, transition away from them. So, you know, I think just keeping it to home, you know, keeping it local um, has served me um, generally um, pretty well. Okay. Um, so this is interesting. Um, so empathy. Um, so um, I'll, I'll speak again by referencing a couple of projects. Um, so to go back to the virtual reality thing, it's been called an empathy machine by Chris Milk, who's someone who makes virtual reality films. Um, but Google didn't quite understand what that actually meant in the context of virtual reality journalism. So um, part of my, my brief was to unpack what empathy was for the t technology company there. Um, and what we came up with was um, a kind of differing view of empathy, not, not just feeling other, someone else's pain, because journalists were thinking, uh, like uh, Noni de la Pena and others who work in this field, uh, Chris Milk, who called virtual reality a empathy machine, that if you put someone in a situation where they really can experience the, the kind of uh, human interaction that's going on, say you, you put them in a, uh, a situation where a policeman stops an African-American and you know, abuses him horribly, and if you could put a person in that situation and really, in a first person, have that person feel what that person who's being stopped uh, is going through, that's going to increase empathy. Um, it doesn't work quite like that. It's not, uh, but we found that virtual reality did give a kind of 360 view of, um, of what a person's situation could be, a more complex understanding of the human situation, whatever that might be. And um, so I had to get that idea across somehow. and. Um, that this technology could um, give a, a wider, a deeper perspective into the, an aspect of the human condition. And I just bring this up because um, that's what all my projects have to be about, really. Um, another project I was on uh, for a, a manufacturer of um, a baby formula. And they had just come up with this new formula. <laughs> And they gave it some cr crazy name like OptiGrow or something. Um, and the, the mothers, the, uh, yeah, like <laughs> really make your child grow and be smart and all that. Um, and uh, you know, when I looked at women feeding their babies, breastfeeding or formula feeding, you know, they couldn't give a shit about the the dialogue and the vocabulary of this formula, OptiGrow, whatever. What they were talking about was nurturing their child creating a social field around uh, the, ch the child so that there would be lots of people to take care of uh, it, her, him. And um, they're, they're trying to create an empathetic field around the, the child. And 
that's really what that project was about. It was about empathy. It wasn't about this formula, this uh, Optigro or whatever it is. And um, it was also about the parenting wars and how parents, mothers have very little empathy for each other if they have a practice uh, that doesn't agree with theirs vis-a-vis -vis feeding their child. Um, anyway, the upshot of that was this commercial of what went viral. It was, was shown on the eve of the Super Bowl of all times, kind of macho, masculine um, uh, event. And I think it, I don't know how many millions of uh, hits it got. It's, and the campaign was called the Sisterhood of Motherhood. But the Sisterhood of Motherhood commercial ends with all these uh, mothers coming together and recognizing their common humanity and um, uh, seeing that whatever way they take toward uh, uh, nurturing and growing their child, um, there should be a degree of acceptance uh, here. So that was all about empathy, really. And I think most of the projects that I'm involved with, um, whether it's for a cold technology company trying to humanize its technologies in some way. People are, are weaving human meanings around these technologies or in these products and they're in a certain way empathizing with them and you have to empathize. You have to understand um, the empathetic factor if you're going to do quote business anthropology. Uh, so for me yeah empathy is a challenging one and it's a bumper sticker term of these days that everyone brings a whole slew of assumptions and personal meanings and personal experiences too, so generally I try to stay away from it. But um, I, I think one of the most interesting things is in my, in my career, numerous times I've been requested to produce an empathy object, a, a one-time creation that will somehow like imbue everyone who touches it with this deep understanding of the people they're trying to serve. Um, and, and my general response to that is, um, I can't buy, build you an empathy object. Maybe I can build you like an empathy house. Um, because in order to feel like something is home, and empathy truly has to be feeling like you are at home with other human beings, at home with other beings in different contexts, uh, it has to be over time. I, I don't think I've ever experienced developing empathy in a single moment. I think it's an overtime thing, gradual. And, Business is really uncomfortable with that sometimes. But uh, so one of the things we do, like probably the classical, the classic like empathy object is a persona and fraught with controversy. Um, but one of the things we did is uh, when I got to WeWork, they use personas. And when I was at Nike, they use personas. When I was in healthcare, they use personas. Um, and so what I try to do is create a practice of what we call like recontextualizing the persona. Um, so typically they're produced once and then designers are like, those don't work. And then oh, they hire a whole new company and they could produce a whole new set. But instead of that, uh, trying to get people to identify the groups that the personas represent and go spend time with those groups over time and have kind of a cadence of recontextualize the persona, bringing more details to it. And you kind of always tend to go through this uh, cycle of like you, you build up the richness and the complexity and then someone's like, it's too complex and then you simplify it and then you build up the richness and complexity. <laughs> and actually, I find that that uh, cycle is probably way more... Uh, indicative of how I think human beings actually develop empathy is we, you know, we're, we're geared towards simplifying things to understand them, but then we get into a context and you're like, whoa, this is way more complex than I ever thought. Um, so for me, that's been a useful way of engaging it. Still, no, no solid idea, but. I think that's, that goes to one of the challenges that I find in my practice right now is as a design firm, the balance between people who are fully focused on the method and people who are fully focused on design. Because as a company, we've gotten away from the paper or the research report. You know, writing an insights report that ends up with those nice, beautiful insight statements um, that is great and captures a lot of knowledge. Um, but then if that's passed off to a client team or a design team, so much is lost there. Um, I, we, we find that very much. We are doing research and design together. Uh, you know, when we talk about the toolkit of design, it's very often the um, 
quantitative, qualitative, or part of it, um, but we are constantly designing and making things out of what we're observing and what we're thinking. So um, that I love the challenge of over time. And the question is, when I work with a company that has a research team and a team that makes things, that that bridge, the quality of that bridge and the extent to which we're making together is often one of the biggest challenges that I see in, in organizations trying to really integrate insights. Sorry, I may have jumped us to another topic. No, not at all. And in fact, I, I'm seeing, speaking of overtime, I think we are <laughs> actually over time, right? So. We'll have to, uh, <laughs> wanted to get into building the community of practice, but we'll have to do that during lunch. Okay. Uh, or rather, instead of a community, I'm thinking maybe an empathy house. An empathy yeah. house. I like that idea. <laughs> so uh, thank you to our panelists. Please give it up. For me. And let's keep this conversation going during the break.